call Merrill Lynch, my trading account, and I'm like, hey, like, what's this margin deal? How's this work? And they're like, well, you can borrow against the stocks you own and buy more stocks. I'm like, let her rip, you know? <laughs> so I just started loading up, loading up, loading up. And I never forget that morning, uh, the news, 9-11 happened. And I mean, that market tanked like it. <laughs> so you know, stocks, everything I had, whatever I had in that portfolio, a little over $100,000, and it was negative. Being in business as many years as I've been in business, knowing what I know, you know, you learn so much more in the field than you ever do from a textbook. You're always learning, you know, you should always be learning and always trying to be a better version of you. So, you know, now as a father, you know, new father and stuff, it's like, yeah, you know, a, lot, a lot of things get in the way. You know, I don't have the free time that I used to have to go rope, jackpot, work out, stay in shape. You start, start to realize that like, I'm not gonna put off to tomorrow, you know, what I can do today. So welcome back to the Wealthy Cowboy Show. I'm Crockett Crothers, the host, and today we have the managing partner of Diversified Payments and my boss, John Keeley, on. And uh, just being able to to be around John in the office and, and things like that, he's got a really cool story. He's lived an interesting life, um, team roped, got to rodeo, team roped, won it all and lost it all in the business world and built it back and uh it, it's really i think it'll be a real good treat for y'all to hear and um so so john how's it going hey good thanks for having me yeah um brody self introduced us and um and and got me started in the payment industry and i, I really appreciate the opportunity and i i'm very glad that i got the opportunity to meet you and uh and and brody got me in this industry y'all have been super super helpful um it, it's life-changing i think um I, I haven't built my income up to to you know anything like y'all or or anything like that but it's it's definitely helped and i i see it and and being able to be around y'all y'all have an energy and and you're growth minded and even though you're you know you've been in the been in it for a while and you've you've done a, you've had a lot of accomplishments you're still looking to grow and and uh and do other things and grow yourself and and things like that so it's it's awesome i'm, I'm very glad to that i got to meet y'all um but let's get let's get into your background so you're you're not originally from texas no nope. and um did you grow up around horses and and that kind of stuff man i grew up in connecticut i was born in new haven connecticut uh, we lived in a little suburban town outside of that, just outside of the city, grew up there, and there was a farm right down the road. So as a little boy, my grandmother loved Westerns. She was a John Wayne fan, yeah. watched every single Western, and I'd spent a lot of time over there. I had a younger brother and sister, so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents helping, you know, give mom and dad a little bit of break. And uh, we watched every single Western, and she's the one who really kind of got me into the whole deal. I mean, yeah. cowboys were cool. Um, they still are cool today. Mm -hmm. I love being a cowboy. And uh, that was her generation, you know, in the 50s and, and those Westerns and black and whites. That that yeah. was the deal. So I had every single little cowboy toy, the Lone Ranger, Tonto, mm -hmm. all that stuff, guns and cowboy hats and stuff and all came from her. So we'd, we'd take a break every now and then, you know, on a Sunday and drive down the road because – the town was a agricultural small town and there was a lot of farm in there and stuff. So there were some places that had cows out there and we'd drive by and pull up on the side of the road in her big old Cadillac and step out and check out the cows. And yeah, I got a little older and there was a farm down the road about a quarter mile. And, you know, back then you mom opened the door and say, Hey, get out of the house, go play. And mm -hmm. a lot different than it is today. You didn't have all the <laughs> fears and worries that you have, but We'd get together with, uh, you know, other kids in the neighborhood and we'd hike through the woods. We'd cross underneath the road on one of those little storm drains, you know, we'd pop up on the other side and there's a giant old pond back there and we'd catfish there all day long. And we'd go down there with a can of corn or something and we'd catfish. And that farmer was awesome. Uh, Walt Best Butte, I'll never forget that guy's generosity. 
I look back and appreciate it more today than I ever did back then, you know, because he could have been a grumpy old man and been like, hey, get off this property. Don't be coming on my place, you know, but he he loved it. You know, I mean, he well, he never come by and said hi to us. He never bothered us, you know, yeah. being on his property or anything. And he'd drive in and out and just kind of go about his day. He was happy to see us there, I think, probably living the life that, you know, he once lived. So they had horses in the back and um, hay barn, you know, a big hay barn back there. And we'd make our way back there. I mean, we'd go through the cow fields and cross under the hot wire fence and stuff. And y'all never talked to the farmer or anything? Y'all just kind of roamed free on his place? We just roamed free on this place, (laughs) yeah. We'd get back in the hay barn and climbing on the hay bales and stuff. And there was, he had some people boarding horses there, so they'd trail ride around the back and some trails and stuff. But that was about the extent of it, you know, for me. So I... My life's been full circle, you know, kind of amazing how things happen. You know, I went from that chapter in my life when I was a young kid, and I absolutely loved that, wanted that life, you know, wanted to ride horses. I mean, would have just done anything to live in it, you know. And um, I never had that opportunity, you know. we My, my parents weren't into, into it, you know. We it just wasn't something we were going to do, you know. They would. I don't even know if there was riding lessons available or anything, but and it's it, it's something to see that too to to see somebody with that drive that doesn't grow up around it per se, like their family didn't do it and all this stuff. Yet they still have some success in the horse world and um, or in agriculture or whatever. They just they just you know grind it out and and find a way to be involved. Whereas like being a country kid or a rodeo kid or a ranch kid or whatever you kind of take it for granted you're just it's there and you're just kind of it's what you do and you're pushed into it so a lot of a lot of people take it for granted and and you really you really saw it and appreciated it you know it's such a great community and uh i mean it's always been you know some of the nicest people in the world it's the reason we landed where we landed in stephenville you know and that's another part of the whole story but you know we left we left that neighborhood and moved to another one we were away from the farm and kind of went through my younger years of schooling and stuff. And I was always a hustler, you know, always working hard and figuring out a way to make money at a young age. Just um, used to go to a golf course and scurry through the woods and find golf balls. We'd wash them off, sell them in egg cartons on the mm-hmm. ninth hole on Sundays and make, you know, 20 bucks here and there and started caddying and worked in a lot of restaurants as a kid growing up. I mean, I don't even think I was 15. I used to skateboard down in these restaurants and always just trying to make some money to get ahead. And I I just always loved business, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, after high school, you know, I I wasn't much for school. And I was was in a land, my cousin had a landscaping business. I was spending a lot of time out there. I was making more money than any of the kids I grew up with, you know, at the time. Those guys were going to summer camp, making a couple bucks during the summer. And I was making a couple hundred bucks a week, you know, back then. So went to college for uh, about one semester. And uh, end of that semester, they pretty much came in and said, hey, it's time to go home. Ask you politely to leave. <laughs> yeah, it's time to go home. So, Where was it? Was that in Connecticut still? That was up in Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, my mom, she probably might see this someday and hate me for reminding her on this. But, <laughs> you know, that was pulling the pictures off my my posters, you know, off the wall. And she says, why are you taking your posters? You got to leave them up in the room. I said, oh, they switch rooms, you know, and <laughs> they could get a new dorm room the next semester. So I took everything out of there. And I was getting to that mailbox, you know, over that break every day, trying to see if I could intercept that letter, <laughs> intercept that letter. And uh, man, you better believe that one day I didn't make it out there. That letter come, you know, <laughs> all hell broke loose. <laughs> so uh, the school part wasn't really for me. You know, I just had. Uh, I think you see that a lot with uh, with entrepreneurial type people. It's like sitting in a classroom and, and learning from somebody that probably has never built anything. You know, in a lot of instances, is is not really for everybody. You know, a lot of times it's for, for me. I've learned more since I've been out of college than I did in college, and and also. A lot of times going into class, you, you're not focused on learning. You're, you know, you're wanting to do other stuff, be outside and stuff like that. And so if you go to it, if you're taking these courses on your own or reading these books on your own and stuff, you have a whole different mindset because you're wanting to absorb that knowledge and uh, and not it's not being forced on you just because your parents wanted you to go or whatever. 
Yeah, it's it it's so different now. Being in business as many years as I've been in business, knowing what I know, you know, you learn so much more in the field than you ever do from a textbook. Mm-hmm. But I had been sitting in a sitting in a class one day, and there was a vending machine outside of that classroom, and uh, I think it was like a religion class or something. I don't remember one <laughs> page of the book or anything, but I knew how many sodas they sold during that class because mm-hmm. I could hear those coins hitting and those cans going out and I was doing the math, you know, they were 50 cents a piece at the time. And I'm thinking, man, that soda machine is just printing money and there's <laughs> nobody working that deal, you know? So, uh, next thing you know, I was in the vending business, you know, I found a vending machine in the newspaper and got into a bartending. And you're school. like 18, 19 years old or something. Yeah, I'm about, about 19 years old. And, uh, I started making a little bit of money with the, uh, vending machine, with that vending machine. And I'm, trying to get up and figuring like, hey, I, I kind of like this idea. I like this business, you know? And I call this guy who owns a big vending company. I said, hey, and so you got some machines for sale and I want to buy some, you know? And he says, how many you got? I says, I got two. And he says, what kind you got? And I said, these little, I paid a hundred bucks a piece for them out of the newspaper. He said, I'm going to give you the best advice I ever give you. He goes, don't go in the vending business. <coughs> he said, I won't sell you none. So I said, oh, man, Okay. So I was kind of back to square one, and about a month goes by. I'm sitting at the table with a older gentleman who had a lot of connections where I grew up, and he said, what have you been doing? I said, well, I've been trying to get this vending machine business going and couldn't really, you know, kind of struggling. He says, well, you need to go talk to so-and-so. I said, well, I did. He didn't want me to, uh, he didn't want to help me, you know. He said, really? He says, go see him tomorrow. I said, <laughs> okay. So I went back the next day, and you would have thought we were long lost cousins, you know, <laughs> open armed. Hey, come on in. Let me help you out. Whatever you need. You need machines, product, inventory, whatever. Let's go. Just took an introduction. Yeah. And uh, so we got going and I built up a vending business and kind of one of my really first ventures being in business um, for myself, you know, legitimately. And that guy was a great mentor to me too. You know, I had a lot of time, a lot of face time with him or, I'd get to go in there and sit in his office. I mean, I had a ro- rolling tab with him. So it was like, pay as you go. No note, no interest, no nothing. Just, you know, every week, every Friday or every Monday, show up and I'd pay him whatever, you know, extra I, I could. But we had a lot of FaceTime and I got to talk to him and I got to learn just from kind of being around him and listening to him. And he was really one of the first people, I mean, a, a real strong influence in my life because he saw me working hard he saw me being successful, and then all of a sudden he started giving me business that was too small for him, you mm-hmm. know? So that was awesome for me. You know, my phone's ringing, and he's saying, hey, you know, I got a couple of accounts. They're a little bit small for us. I think they'd be a good fit for you. We got so close that I opened up. I grew to the size where I needed a warehouse, had a couple of trucks. Well, I got a warehouse space right across the street from his warehouse. <laughs> so, I mean, I wouldn't have to travel too far to get over there. So... What was it? Just just sodas and well, snacks or what? Yeah. So we started with soda and snack machine. Um, I ended up selling that business. Um, had some run-ins with the law. Kind of went down the mm-hmm. wrong path and got into some trouble. Had some run-ins with the law. And when I was kind of done doing what I had to get done, I came back. I got back in that vending machine business. It was funny. I was coming back on a – got to the airport and I hopped on a uh, – they had these like shuttle buses that take you from the airport to different drop-off places, mm-hmm. you know? And um, we start stopping at all these stops, like with the bus, and there's all these vending machines everywhere. And these the buses would stop. I mean, there'd be hundreds of buses. All these people get off, they'd run in, hit these vending machines, get all this stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, this thing's cash cow, you know? So I start talking to the bus driver, and I'm like, man, who owns these deals? And ironically, my lawyer <laughs> had just bought it. So I get back and I call my lawyer up. I said, hey, what's the chances that we uh, talk about the vending machine deal? And sure as, sure as heck, I was back in the vending machine business right <laughs> after that. So, uh, you know, it was interesting. Um, I built that business up. We we're doing snack and soda machines. And then we got into amusement. So I was doing pool tables, pinballs, jukeboxes, uh, coffee service. We we're doing water coolers plumbing, water cooler, stuff you see now um, didn't really exist back then. You know, it was it was what was cutting edge at the time. You know, everybody now, even to date, you see the big 
water jug with the five gallon bottle that's going yeah. on the top of it. Um, at that time, I had come in to be introduced to a guy that had a filtration water cooler, one of the first, you know, at that time. So you didn't have to have the jug on the top anymore, but it was just a filter. So I was like, man, this is kind of cool. You know, I've been in a lot of offices where I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these bottles. And I think the solution would be put this deal in here. It's going to reduce workman's comp. It's never going to be empty. You're not going to have all that floor space taken up and stuff. So I got into some Fortune 500 companies, um, which was kind of a, a big step for me, you know, kind of a young kid starting his own business, no college degree, no real sales experience or anything. So it was... Uh, How are you getting these accounts and these locations? Like, were you just... Was there a marketing or sales strategy or were you just door knocking and going in and talking to people or... Yeah, I was door knocking. So, you know, I wasn't a computer savvy person at the time. Um, gosh, I mean, you know, flyers and all the marketing stuff, whatever. I mean, I I hadn't been around it. I didn't know anything about it. So door knocking was really uh, what I had. And I'll tell you, vending machine sales, I mean, it's one of the hardest sales. Mm -hmm. It's one of the hardest sales. People don't know it. Um, there's not that many guys out there selling vending machines. But if you go to a large company and they've got their break room set up with that snack machine, soda machine, I mean, those employees are living off that deal. Yeah. So to walk in the deal and say, hey, you know, I've got a better opportunity. I want to change out your snack and soda machine for you. They're like, man, we are not going to disrupt this company. <laughs> So, I mean, it, it was a hard sell. But. I always I always wondered about that. Like, were you, like in that business, do you look for an opportunity where there's there's nothing there or is it is it usually taken and you're trying to switch it out? You know, you're trying to switch it out. Um, it always comes down to service, you know, and just like anything else, just like the business that we're in today, you know, mm -hmm. there's so much business that happens and just gets, you know, people are of that mentality of like set it and forget it. Let me sell the customer today and put this in there today. And as things change and evolve, we're never going to go back and revisit them. We're never going to touch it again. We're never going to show any more opportunity. So it was, uh, I kind of found my sweet spot to being able to sell this stuff, you know? And for me, it was like, I just need an appointment to walk into the break room with them and do an assessment on the vending in the break room that they had. Mm -hmm. I already knew just by going in there, I could look at that machine in 10 seconds and knew if it was overpriced, what type of food was in there. Um, and and we were going through a phase at that time in dieting, right? So mm -hmm. at, at that time was right when all these like little 100 calorie packs were coming out. You know, people wanted to start eating healthy. Starting to evolve a little bit. Yeah. So you looked at a typical vending machine and it's got all your candy bars, all your chips, all your little salt crackers and gum and stuff like that, but it didn't really have any healthy alternatives. So mm -hmm. our pitch at that time was walking in the door with, hey, we've got a, you know, a large section of healthy alternatives, help keep your people happy and stuff. And um, we would put a survey out there, basically. We'd put a survey out there and say, hey, run this by your, your people and see what they want to put in. So we're letting the customers make the choice versus us just filling it with the standard items that you put in the vending machine. Mm -hmm. And we would make so much more money than anybody else ever did at those locations because we had the attention to detail, you know? And if I knew, hey, 50% of these people want, you know, this Snackwell cracker or whatever, the 100 calorie cracker, like I'm going to put four rows of those deals in and they'd be cleaned out every single time. Well, I'm going to put five rows in next time, six, whatever it took to accommodate and keep, you know, keep them Really happy. paying so, attention to the service, atten attention to what people wanted. Yep. And the attention to detail and the service, I mean, that was really it. So we started to build a reputation. I had a, I had a really nice route where everything was, it was, was within a couple miles off of the freeway. So you didn't really have to get too far out and, you know, off of a main route to service them and stuff. So you could be pretty quick. And, um, you know, little by little, just like anything else, you start to build a reputation and you start to have some references and referrals and it really helps you move on down the road, you know, mm -hmm. bigger companies, people would move to another company and then, you know, remember you and, and call you. So, so that was pretty neat. Um, you know, I segued out of the, the vending business and, and sold that company. I left Connecticut back. I was about probably 26, maybe 27. You stayed in it for a little while then. I was in it for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was probably, I was probably in it five, five, six years, seven years, maybe on and off, you know, mm -hmm. 
Um, I got out of that, moved to California, just literally packed a bag, sold out. I'd, I'd gone to visit a buddy of mine in California one day. and um, Were you roping any in Connecticut or no, riding horses or anything? No, not at all. So not at all. I, uh, it was the furthest thing from my mind, you know, <laughs> and anybody that knows me from my childhood in those years, I mean, they would tell you, we'd, we'd have borrowed the money to bet against if you told us, <laughs> Hey, this is what this guy's going to be doing later on. They'd tell you, Hey, we'd have borrowed the money to bet against it. There's no way, you know, I was driving Cadillacs, wearing sweatsuits, vending, vending machines, and at the casino rolling dice. I, I mean, I saw a picture of you um, on Facebook the other day of y'all were in the stockyard doing your wife, and you had a like a fila j- yeah, jumpsuit. Yeah, on. yeah. Oh man, I still have them, and it's uh, it's like my my precious piece of clothing. I always have to have one nice velour tracksuit in the closet, and I just I just love it, you know. Um, people laugh when I break it out, but it's like, hey, man, I, li- I lived in those things, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know? <laughs> that was my daily, my, as much as much as you put a cowboy hat on, I'd, I'd put one of those on. You, <laughs> you, know? you were like the Vinden gangster of Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so you know, I go to visit a buddy of mine in California one time. I'd, I'd already, you know, I got in trouble with the law, and I, I ended up in Arizona for two years. First time I ever left the state of Connecticut, really, other than like a trip to Disney, so... I get out to Arizona and with the plane lands and I see palm trees and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, man, I got on the wrong flight. <laughs> like I'm thinking there's going to be cactus and stuff here and not just palm trees. I think I got on the wrong flight. I'm in Florida, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just never forget being in Arizona for that time as I was watching the day, you know, counting the days like, man, it's still sunny. It's still sunny. There's no rain. It's still sunny. Every single day. I mean, you're going on three, four months. It's like, man, there's not a bad day of weather here, you know, beautiful fountains and tile roofs on these, you know, Spanish style buildings and mm-hmm. stuff. It was something I never, never experienced before, you know, in my life. So I'd gone back to Connecticut for a year or two, kind of got back into vending, got back, started kind of dabbling back in what I was doing. They got me in trouble again. And a buddy of mine moved to San Diego and he says, man, come and come out and stay with me, you know, check out this place. And I go and he's living right on the beach in Del Mar, California. I wake up in the morning and, and, all this, him and his roommates, they get up and they run outside. They grab their surfboards. They run outside of the beach. They go surf. They come back. They light the fireplace and they bring back these breakfast burritos, you know, potato, egg, cheese, bacon. And they're sitting there noshing on these burritos. Like, well, man, this this is pretty good right here. <laughs> so I literally, uh, it was a turning point for me in my life. I was like, you know what? I'm not, I got a good little business here. I'm kind of starting to go down that path again that I don't need to be going down, but it's just, naturally kind of drawn me there, you know? Yeah. I was like, needed a change of environment. Yeah. And I said, you know, I'm done. And I literally went home. I sold my business in a week, cut it up into three different sections, the food and beverage, the coffee service and the amusements. And I sold to all my competitors. I said, take me apart or take me whole. And, uh, had a bunch of money, had a surfboard. Um, it was kind of a thing for me that I was always I thought was cool, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'd go up to Rhode Island every once in a while and try to surf and flounder around out there a little bit. And so um, you already knew how to surf a little bit before. Little you Little bit, not really, you know, at at any high level. So uh, I went out to California, and I'm, when I tell you, I went out there without a plan and without anything. I landed, and I got a cab, and that cab i said we started driving i said man pull over wherever you see a little newspaper deal you know and mm-hmm. pulls over i get the free newspaper and i start looking for apartments like i didn't even have a place to live yet mm-hmm. so did you I'm, go to san diego like around that buddy or were you where were you at? um he moved right after that so i okay, actually um so yeah, you he, didn't you didn't know anybody or just... i didn't know anybody yeah he he was there but he ended up getting a girlfriend and moving up to like orange county like overnight or something like right after i left so so he wasn't even nearby to hang out and see. I just went like cold. <laughs> and uh, I grabbed his newspaper. I find me this little apartment by the beach. It's like 700 bucks a month or something. And I have him drop me off there. And that's it. And I got a surfboard hanging out of the back of this back window of this cab and I slept on the floor first night, you know, <laughs> had nothing, no food, no blankets, no, just a duffel bag of clothes. Next day I get out, buy me a car and kind of get some furniture and, get my wheels on the ground and start trying to figure out like, man, what am I going to do? You know, mm-hmm. now I got a bunch of money. I just sold my business and I'm in a great spot. So 
I had this dream and I'm thinking, okay, man, this is the life I want. I'm going to, I'm going to have an apartment on the beach right here. I'm going to wake up every morning. I'm going to go surf and live that, you know, California surfing lifestyle. I'm going to buy me a Porsche convertible. So I have this coolest car to cruise up and down in this beautiful weather. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be a day trader and I'm going to trade the stock market. Yeah. And I did it. I lost everything. <laughs> Not it didn't take me very long either. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, did you have like did you just start doing it? Did you read a book or as a mentor or anything, or are you just getting on the computer and trading? Yeah, and I I I had a couple of buddies that had been doing it. I think I had an e trade account. No no formula, just mm -hmm. putting your money out there. Yeah. <laughs> I knew how to gamble, you know. I yeah. grew up. I was I was a I was a gambling man for a long time, and and I knew how to gamble. And it was probably the dumbest decision I ever made, you know. <laughs> so I tried to read a few little books about options and trading and stuff, but really nothing that ever taught me anything or knew anything. I was just gambling. I was playing on the market. We were in the tech in the tech market like boom at that time. So I mean, just the when was the, it? When was this? Gosh, this was right before nine eleven. So, uh, right before this is about, about 2000. Yeah. This was right about 2000, right before nine 11 or so. And you're um, in your late twenties here. I'm just about, yeah, I'm just about. And, uh, um, you know, the tech booms happening. So you, you, you pick any tech stock that's out there, you know, mm -hmm. and that's stocks trading for 50 bucks this morning. I mean, it's going to be 60 bucks tomorrow, 70 bucks the next day. I mean, the fluctuations, five, 10, $15, but these stocks are on the move. Mm -hmm. So I actually did all right for a little while. And I thought like, man, I'm so smart. I got this thing figured out, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think I made like 10,000 or something. Well, the gambler in me, you know, I want to just, hey, I want to, I want to go all in, you know, I'm ready. So I call Merrill Lynch, my trading account, and I'm like, hey, like, what's this margin deal? How does this work? And they're like, well, you can borrow against the stocks you own and buy more stocks. I'm like, let her rip, you know? <laughs> so I just start loading up, loading up, loading up. And I never forget that morning, uh, the news, 9-11 happened. And I mean, that market tanked like a rock. <laughs> so, I mean, stocks, everything I had, whatever I had in that portfolio, a little over $100,000, I mean, was negative. I mean, I'm looking at the computer as zero, you know, and then my broker calls from Merrill Lynch and they're like, hey, you know, you owe like 18,000. I'm like, well, how do you figure? <laughs> and they're like, well, you got that margin account, you know, so you owe on the margin that you borrowed against that deal. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, you know, so... <laughs> I really went to uh do, do you think like was that just bad luck or do you think you I mean you you doesn't sound like you really had a skill there you like you were just kind of blindly putting some money yeah. out there and and then you just I mean anybody the best day trader out there could never predict 9 uh, 9 11 or you know covid or anything like that yeah, I'd never survived. You know, I mean, it I was, was it was going to happen eventually. Yeah, it was it was going to happen sooner or later. There was absolutely no way I could have survived. Um, you know, I had an interest at some point in there where I was like, oh, maybe I ought to go get my Series Six and Seven and like go work for a brokerage because I liked numbers, I liked money, and I liked the action. You know, mm -hmm. buying, selling, and trading and stuff. And you see those movies, Wall Street, and these guys on the stock market. Yeah, yo, go buy, sell. You know, and it's like. Yeah. Like an auction. Kind right? of, yeah, yeah. kind of like some adrenaline there. Yeah. So for me, you know, I was a junkie for that. And I'm thinking, man, that I think that kind of fit me pretty good. But foolishly, I didn't take the steps necessary to learn anything about it and just kind of went in blind thinking like, oh, this is easy. And mm -hmm. nothing's easy. You know, everything, anything and everything, to be successful in anything and everything requires hard work. No Every, matter, everybody just sees the result of something there and – they jump into that and they don't understand that they're that what who, whatever that person is successful in there was a whole period there where it sucked the grind yeah yeah the grind the sleepless and, nights and that's in that's in rodeo and business and everything that I've seen yeah At every successful story something you know they slept on the floor they they put it all out there you know they were working for free or whatever there was a yeah there was a long gap there and then all of a sudden they you know, an opportunity comes and they're ready for it and it hits. And then 
everybody's like, oh, must be nice. <laughs> Those are the greatest stories, though, aren't they? And <laughs> yeah. when you sit back and listen to a guy tell his life story or the turning point in his life, you mm -hmm. know, um, they're so interesting. I could sit back and listen to those all day long, you mm -hmm. know? So uh, I go to looking for work at the time, you know, I hadn't really... And like like you were you were negative, like, do you, like were you like negative to like nothing to eat, couldn't pay your car payment, couldn't pay your rent? Was, yeah, I was 30 days, like 30 days kind of. Yeah, you had 30 days to come up with some money. 30 days to figure out what was going to happen next and how we were going to get by, you know? So... Uh, I go to apply for this job, and uh, it was a second shift forklift driver. You know, I'd been had a vending machine business. I knew how to run a forklift around and move some stuff. So I was thinking, you know what? This job seems kind of cool. I'm still in California. I mean, I'm not going to go back home. Still with Still by the beach. Yeah, still by the beach. Like the dream still, part of the dream still exists. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to. have gonna... to get rid of the Porsche, though. Oh, yeah. That was long gone. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I wasn't going to tuck my tail between my legs and go go crawling back home, mm -hmm. you know. There was nothing there for me anyway. Yeah. You know, so uh, I figured, you know what, maybe it's time after all these years I actually get a job. I had never really had a job before. Mm -hmm. So everything was self-made, you know. I mean, I was always... Always work for yourself. Always work for myself. I mean, even if even my younger years, you know, on the golf course when I was a caddy, it's like you show up at the caddy shack and... They come out and pick you to carry bags and caddy for the day, but you're not on a schedule. You know, mm -hmm. nobody's. Yeah, you're not following. No any, clock in, clock no out. Clock in, clock out, or nothing. You know, so um, I find this job, second shift forklift driver, and I'm thinking, man, that's pretty cool. I could sleep in, I could run this forklift during the day here and make like twelve bucks an hour or something. I could go out party at night, chase girls, and just mm -hmm. live by the beach and have a great time. You know, and they bring me in for this interview. It's like a temp to perm firm or something. They bring me in for this interview. I go through two interviews, two different people, two different rooms. And the manager, I guess, or sales manager comes walking in and he sits down with me. He says, man, you really think you're a forklift operator? And I said, I can run a forklift. And he says, let me take you for a walk. And he opens the door and takes me in the back and here's all the recruiters. And I'm I'll go, man, this is pretty cool. There are guys my age and they're on the phone and everybody's dressed nice and everybody's doing something, you know? And I said, what's this? And he says, this is being a job recruiter, you know? And he said, I think this would be a better fit for you. Would you want to consider coming to work full time in here? So I'm like, I would never thought of this, you know? Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, I'm in there for, they put me in an engineering department, which I know nothing about engineering. I got a buddy who's an engineer, and I'm calling him on the phone like, man, what do I need to know? <laughs> like, <laughs> Teach me some of the jargon. Yeah, he's like, I've been to college for four years. I can't just tell you what you need to know about engineering, you know. But you were just looking for for prospects or like to to place at uh, engineering firms or something? Yeah. So we had uh, – it's a crazy story, but it's a, this is a, kind of my catapult, you know, to where – my next deal, but uh, – is that is that like a a commission deal or is so it hourly? Or? It, it's a salary deal, like a regular you know a regular salary pay, and then have these little bonus and spiff. So mm -hmm. you pretty much spend all day sitting in a cubicle, and there's databases full of people that have been looking for jobs all over the years. Yeah, and you get a job rec that basically says, "Hey, I need an engineer for you know that knows C plus or whatever it is for." for this job and you just start smiling down hey crockett you know i've got an opportunity at this company would you be interested in coming in and interviewing for a position at so and so pretty tough mm -hmm. uh, pretty tough a lot of calls not a lot of stuff happening so uh i'm in this engineering department and they come up one day i'm, I'm kind of getting bored i'm there for about a month in or so i've got this sales manager and a small little team the engineering group there's like three of us not a whole lot going on and I've learned the lingo. I've done all I could do to kind of really start to understand how to talk the talk. So they come in on a Monday and they go, uh, we had these Monday morning red zones, you know, and they talk, everybody comes in, claps their hands, talks about, this is what we're going to do for the week. This is what the sales managers are going to, the jobs the sales managers are going to get. And these are the deals that you guys, the little grunts are going to try to fill the jobs. Mm -hmm. So they go, we got us. We got a deal going on today, and it's um, any sales. So it was like 
any sales rep, so it was it was guys at our level, right, had the opportunity to get a new account like the sales manager would would get. So they go, we're going to put this out there for the week. All the sales sales reps, you have an opportunity to get a new account, a new job rec. And any one of you who gets it, the first one who gets it is going to get like two days off, two days paid off and like a hundred bucks or something, you know? So I'm thinking, pretty cool, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, something more exciting than just calling all day. So lunchtime comes, this is on a Monday, lunchtime comes, I open up the paper. I mean, this is where, I mean, the internet wasn't even what it was back then. You know, nowadays you hop on Google and do all these searches. I mean, back then you're still pulling open a newspaper and looking at the help wanted section. Mm -hmm. So, and I find this guy and he's, uh, they redesign airplane seats or something. And he's not too far from where the office is. And I call him, first call I make, New Jersey accent. So I'm like, oh, my people, man, <laughs> I got this guy. And we start talking about Italian restaurants in Jersey and what's going on. I said, hey, listen, I said, uh, can I come up and, and meet you in person? I said, I've got, you know, I know you're looking for this position. Can I come up and meet in person and, and talk to you about it? And he goes, yeah. So I said, I'm on my lunch in 30 minutes. I'm going to get up there. So I get up there, I meet the guy and we get to talking and he says, oh, you're with the temp agency. You know, we're, I'm looking for permanent. I'm not going to pay a temp agency or none of that stuff. I'm not interested. And I said, listen, man, I got like seven guys that are qualified, more than qualified for this, that are hungry and looking to work. I could put them in here like right now. I said, would you just give me a chance to show you their resume and tell you what the opportunity is? He goes, all right, yeah, sure. So I show him and next thing you know, he turns around, comes back out and he says, I want all three of these guys. It's like, wow, <laughs> man, you do? And he goes, yeah, okay. I, let me, give me about an hour, let me get back. So I shoot back to the office, everybody's coming in and, Everybody says, all right, you know, what's going on? Anybody got any job wrecks, any sales guys? You know, these, nobody was even, nobody was going to even get one if you gave them a year, you know? Yeah. I said, man, I got one right here. And they thought I was kidding. And he, <laughs> I said, no, I got one. So he comes and he looks at it and he says, man, you you, you got one? I said, yeah, I went up on lunch. I talked to this dude and I, I got one. And he goes, oh man, he's he's got one. This deal's real. So. <laughs> We got to find three positions for this deal, isn't? And I said, "Hey, hey, hey! I already got them filled." And he says, "What?" And I said, "Yeah, I got the three guys too." So he goes, "Oh my God!" So I win the deal <laughs> for that day, you know. So uh, it was my first experience in corporate America. I, I do this right, and I'm the shining star. The sales manager's like, "Oh mm -hmm. my God, this is the guy right now," <laughs> you know. My sales manager, well, he's not too happy, right? Because I really just rained on his parade. Yeah. You know, he probably hadn't done that much all year. <laughs> and um, next thing you know, man, I'm like a little pit bull. Like, you can't pull me back. That's all I want to do. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call people and job hunt, and, you know, looking for job. I'm like, I want to go after the big stuff. So I start calling, and I mean, I'm just laying them up. I mean, laying them up like they've never had happen. So all of a sudden... All the suits from corporate, I think it was like Maryland or something, they show up one day and they come in and we have this sit down and they're like, hey, we got to help you understand how it goes here. And I'm like, okay, how's it go here? He goes, your manager's been with the company for nine years. You've only been here for a month and a half. I'm like, okay. So you've got to put in a lot more time before you can get to where he go, where he is. You know, yeah. I'm like, I get it. So here's what we're going to do. You can keep doing what you're doing because we like what you're doing, but he has to go on every appointment with you to do the deal. And you're not going to get the bonus. You're not going to get all this other stuff and just like whatever. And I'm like, you know what, man? Okay. Okay. I'll do it because everything, I, I didn't like the way anything else was going. Were you? Was it like you started closing deals where you – making money like was that the helping company, you the company was making money i was still yeah, making it, like 300 bucks a week or something yeah, you know nothing yeah so uh they they fly me out to baltimore for some corporate training for like a week you know and i kind of go through that first time ever experience you know this is the time this starts this is where you have to be and sign all the paperwork and policies procedures go through that deal come back and they tell me okay he's got to go with you on every appointment so we go on the first appointment, wasn't really a big deal, wasn't, wasn't happening anyway. 
we go on the next appointment and uh, my guy starts talking over me. My sales guy starts talking over me. Well, the, the, the business owner had already had this little rapport with me. He liked me. And we, he's about to shut the whole thing down like right then and there because my, he just he didn't like the way my sales guy's you know, talking to him and stuff. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, listen, before we even talk business or anything else, why don't you give us a tour around the place? Like, I really want to see what you guys do. How'd you get started in this business? You know, how'd you get to where it is today? And we're going through this whole tour. And I mean, we're laughing. We're having a good time. He's telling stories, you know, back and everything. And me and him have this great rapport. My sales guy, I already know. He's, he's, I already know. He's just thinking about like, oh, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. There's nothing here, you know. But there was. And we sit down. We sit down. And I could tell that he's about to say, man, you know what? Let's let's write this up. Let's I'm going to let you guys get me the, the help I need and mm -hmm. I'll do this contract with you. He's right there. He's just so happy. He's like comfortable. He's ready. He's sitting back in his chair and my sales manager kind of gets up out of his chair and reaches across the table to handshake him early and he's like, hey, thanks for your time. I know we can't really provide you what you wanted and you're not interested in our services now, but hopefully, you know, we could keep in touch and he just looks at me like, Wow, you know, and he goes, Yeah, thanks, no problem, leave. And, and I'm like, Oh my God, like, I can't believe that just happened, you know? We get back to the corporate office and I walked in the sales manager's office and I said, Bud, I'm out. And he's like, What happened? I, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it anymore, you know? So uh, I quit that deal. And this is probably 2001. I get. <clears throat> End up going next door. There was a mortgage company, so I'd seen some people like selling mortgages and stuff. I get mm -hmm. in there, I start start selling mortgages. That mortgage deal takes me in the real estate market, and I start. I get my real estate license. I start selling real estate mortgages. So we go through this massive boom. I think it was two thousand one or two thousand two. We had like the most rate decreases ever. I think there was like eleven. The rate dropped 11 times during that year. So, so you're getting refis. Oh, new, man. Everybody's buying. Just Everybody. like it was not too long ago. Yeah. I mean, we are shaking and baking. I mean, it's... So you're you're a real estate agent and you're selling mortgages? Yeah. So I'm at this office up in Solana Beach, California. With every single real estate deal that I sell, I'm doing the financing on it too. So, you know, typically in real estate, you're getting 3%. There's a 6% commission, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's a 3% for the buyer side and 3% for the sell side. And then there's a mortgage. So on the loans at that time, we're making like five points, 5% 5 on the loan amount. And then we'd get the 3% and I had my, whatever my split was, you know, with, that, mm -hmm. with the brokerage at that time. So times were good. And we... we were you, were, were these big deals, like big money deals, or were you kind of... Yeah. Yeah, they were big deals, not as big as they are today, but I mean they were, you know, five, six hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand dollars. And I mean, you do the math on mm -hmm. commissions I'm talking about, you know, guys making so, sixty, so you're seventy, back. eighty thousand. You did, know? Did, did you think that? Or you're like, man, I'm back. Yeah. It was uh it was uh it, it was refreshing because I was really like at that point, like back against the wall, just thinking like, man, where where am I? Where am I going to go next? What mm -hmm. am I going to do? You know, and you start seeing people your own age being successful in the workforce with jobs, you know, with their careers. Like they had already had a job out of college for so long that they're, they got promoted, moved up or moved to another company. And they're, mm -hmm. they're starting to get happy, right? They're starting to make enough money, buy a house, have a family. And you're still sitting there going, man, I'm kind of still thinking about it, you know? So uh, anyway... I end up building that business, you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So I, I take off with, with this uh, firm for about two and a half, three years, learn the business inside and out, and I get my broker's license, build my own team. Mm -hmm. So I model out, I've got one loan guy, I've got three sales agents, and I'm doing the marketing, which I love. I just absolutely love marketing. So I'm running ads, and I'm doing all sorts of radio and different stuff, get that phone ringing, and... We're just scheduling calls. So the girls are going out every single night. They're going and showing two, three houses. And my other guy's in the office pre-qualifying all the loans and stuff. So we're cranking. We end up opening two more offices in two other states. I mean, we're going big time at that time. 
and um, still no horse in the picture, still no, probably hadn't really met. Are you surfing or yeah. anything? Yeah, I'm surfing, I'm traveling, I'm, uh, I'm going to Italy a couple times a year, I'm spending a lot of time in Costa Rica, I end up buying some oceanfront property down in Costa Rica, I mean, I'm... I'm Living. I'm hiding out in Costa Rica for the most part. I mean, I'm down there and people don't even know I'm down there. Yeah. I'm on a little dial up phone line at an internet cafe and a phone card, you know, and I've got closing documents coming through. You know, the eFax was like the big <laughs> technology at the time. So, like, oh, eFax it. I'm down here. It's like the power's trickling, trying to get the page to print, <laughs> sign it, like fax it back, you know, get enough money on the phone card. And nobody ever knew where I was. So, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, kind of that whole transition of about 2008, you know, that market's right, right around 2008, I go to my first rodeo, maybe 2007. I go to Poway, California rodeo. And, uh, first one to watch or first, first one to first, enter. First one to watch, man. And, uh, you know, it took me back. Like just, I had some friends that are like, Hey, there's a rodeo in Poway. You want to go? I'm like, yeah, hell, let's go. First time. Man, I get there and it's just like, this is the action I've been looking for, you know? <laughs> and I'm sitting in the stands thinking like, how do I get back there behind the chutes and get on one of them bulls? But you know? before that point, were you were you looking for something or like you're making a lot of money, but were you like, you're not happy still or man, I was looking I was, for something to do, looking for a hobby or something like that? You know, uh, I think in, in part, like you're lost in your own identity, right? You're trying to figure out your own identity. It's like the money's great. When you got money and, and all the stuff, it's like, I got three cars in the driveway, Land Rover, Porsche convertible, old vintage VW bus, every surfboard a guy can imagine. But still there's an emptiness inside you. You know, it's like, it, it, the, the money doesn't buy happiness. You know, there was something else I was needing, something else I was looking for. So I'm in Costa Rica one day. I'm down there in this little spot. I mean, I got this place and you, it takes like six hours to get there. It's you're driving down, like you got to drive out. There's no street names. There's just people tell you a landmark. Like, look for the tree with the fork and two rocks and take a ride. And it's like, shoot, man, all right. <laughs> And you drive out, you get on this ferry and you drive two hours across this ferry and you got your vehicle on there and they got a little bar on there drinking like Cuba Libras and a little ham sandwich or something. And you drop off, you're in the jungle, man. I mean, there's monkeys and everything out there. There's not, no paved roads, no street signs, no modern day civilization as we know. And uh, I drive across these farm fields and I come out on the other end where this guy had told me, that's how you get there, you know, and this was, this was the place. So, uh, uh, Mal Pais, the Badlands in Costa Rica. Cool, cool town. Nobody's out there, man. It's like there's two or three little hotels. I mean, hammocks. You could rent a hammock and mm -hmm. sleep in a hammock and stuff. And there's this guy, they called him Juan Caballo. He had like three horses that he rented to go down the beach. <clears throat> well, Juan was kind of the the know-it-all of the town. He was the real estate guy. He had the horses for, he could kind of get you anything you wanted, you know? So me and Juan, we become buddies and we start having coffee at his place every day. And one day I'm like, I see this horse in the road. <coughs> it's raining. I'm walking down this dirt road. This picture's on my Facebook. It means a lot to me. I'm walking down this road and there's this horse on the road just there. There's nothing else. It's pouring rain, big palm trees and leaves, this dirt road. And there's this horse just standing there. And uh, I'm like, what the heck, man? You know, that horse... Go about my business a couple of days later again. I'm start traveling. I'm just investigating, you know, like walking, hiking, going place. And there's that horse again, you know, in this other spot. And I'm like, this horse keeps popping up. I'm sitting on this little patio where I'm staying at night one night and just kind of sitting out there. And all of a sudden I hear this noise. I'm noticing that horse right behind me. And then it comes up in there. So I go to Juan Caballos the next day for coffee and and I, I said, is that your horse? And he says, yeah. And I said, man, that, I've been seeing that thing everywhere. And he says, oh, yeah, he gets out all the time. He's just kind of wanders around town and comes back, whatever, you know. And I said, can I ride him? And he goes, yeah, you ride him. So I go, well, what, I don't know how to ride. You know, what do you, what do, you do? And he says, well, you see that blanket over there, that Navajo? He says, just throw it over him and just get on. <laughs> I go, that, that's all you do. You just get on him. Huh? And he's like, Yeah. There's like a rope around his neck or something. Not even, I mean, he's not even have a basal or nothing on him, you know. 
He goes, yeah, just get on them. So I'm like, this sucker was on autopilot, you know? So I, all right, you know, heck, let's see what we got here. And I was cowboy for the day, you know, just <laughs> hop on and we're, he'd go all the way down the beach to one end, he'd turn, he'd come all the way back and go back to the house. It was just No like, matter what you did, he was just kind of doing no, it. You were just along for the ride. Kick and pull and stand and do cartwheels. He was, <laughs> he was autopilot, you know? So I kind of fell in love with that moment, you know, in time and it, brought me back to my childhood and I'm like, man, I kind of always wanted to do this. And my grandma would be so proud, you know, and mm-hmm. love to see this. My grandmother was just starting to fight cancer at that time. So I started going back to see her. I was with her. She passed away of cancer. And right after that, <clears throat> I kind of made that commitment to myself. I'm like, you know what? Like I would tell her, you know, she I play guitar too. So she would always love, like I told her, hey, I rode this horse, you know, and I'd play my guitar for her and stuff. And she loved it. So, uh, after she passed, I said, man, I'm going to learn how to ride a horse. This is my 30th birthday was coming up, and I said, I'm going to learn how to ride a horse this year. So I went, and I got riding lessons at some barn out in California, and the girl had a horse, and I uh, spent about two weeks learning how to tack one up and pick a hoof and basic stuff. And mm-hmm. she's so got me on a lunge line. I'm 30, you know, on a lunge line, <laughs> just going around this arena thinking, oh, yeah, you know, and that horse was a thoroughbred. And finally, I said, man, let's get out on the trails, you know. And we get out on this trail out on the back of Camp Pendleton Marine Base. And this sucker takes off. I mean, thoroughbred just gets running, you know, and it's jumping over like little ditches and stuff. And I'm thinking, holy smokes, you know, like, (laughs) but I survived. So I was like, this is it. You know, I love it. And I'd seen the rodeo a couple years before and was kind of like, man, I just kind of stayed in the back of my mind with that whole deal. So when you watched the rodeo, it was like, were you drawn to team roping or did it? I was drawn to the bull riding. Yeah. Yeah. I was drawn to the bull riding. I mean, had I known what I know now when I was younger, I mean, I'd have been, I might not be here today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I might not have made it too good on a bull, but I dang sure would have tried, you know? I, I get, you know, through the years and meeting people, get to a rodeo one time and there's a guy, he's a team roper. I'm roping with him and he's, bull riding too at the end and he's like hey mate get over here and pull my rope from get behind those bucking shoots and it's like wow i mean the energy is like it's like a rocket ship and you get back there I yeah mean, just you could hear all the music and everything and that bull's in there just banging around in the pan and i mean and you know it's like one nod this gate opens and it's hi yeah you know it's like an explosion yeah total explosion so it was a cool experience, but you know, I get to, uh, I get to riding around. I spend about a year with these lessons on that ranch, and uh, they bring a rescue horse in. This horse is at the kill barn, kill sale, I guess. And one of the ladies decides to buy him for like five hundred bucks. This Palomino, and uh, she's going to save him. Never been rode, never been touched, or nothing. You know, probably two, three year old Palomino, whatever. And I said, uh, "What's that horse's name?" She says, "Trigger." It was Roy Rogers, you know, every every Palomino you know is named mm-hmm. Trigger, right? Oh, my grandma loved Roy Rogers and Trigger. So I, I gotta have Trigger. I gotta pet him. I gotta I'm feed him, you know, I can spend time with him. And so finally I'm like, hey, can I ride Trigger? And they're like, he's never been rode, you know. But he's gonna go into training, you know, and my teacher's gonna be the trainer or something. So I'm like, mm-hmm. let me ride him, let me ride him, let me ride him. Because now I've been I've been for one year, I've been you know, riding on a lunge line and Doing I've been, methods. I've been, I've been Beginner. lunge lining around and I'm ready to roll, you mm-hmm. know? So. <laughs> I think you know it all now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I get out on old trigger one day, I take him out the back arena and he's cool. You know, we get to walking around out there and I got this big old egg bitting him, you know, just no, no stopping it, no nothing. Don't even know anything about what to put on a horse. Just what I've been riding this broke old sag on, nag on, you know, forever. So I ride them out back there. Well, they get to coming out in the gator to feed. And we're in the backside of that pen. And old Trigger, he just figures, hey, it's time to do what I do when that feed truck's coming. And I'm going to start bucking and running. <laughs> and he takes off. We're going full speed ahead. And I'm pulling on these reins, holding that saddle horn. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa. You know, and he's not stopping. I don't know anything about any other way to stop him. You know, mm-hmm. we get coming so fast to that gate. And there's a big old scrap metal pile over there, barbed wire and everything. And I'm thinking, man, it is time to abort. And I just dive off of him. 
laying flat on my stomach. I mean, about knocked the wind out of me, you know. And I'm laying there thinking, I don't know how many bones I broke, you know. <laughs> and he comes up behind me. And just kind of noses me and, you know, gets me gets me up and going. So I end up buying this horse, this this trigger horse. I mean, I just have it in me. I end up buying this horse. Had he had, when you buy him, and he had had like, was he broke a little bit? Or? That's me. That was it, man. <laughs> he, he broke me before I broke him. <laughs> that was the relationship we had. So so I got this horse. I buy him for about 500 bucks, and uh, they sold him. You know, the story goes is they sold him to this lady who just came out of rehab. And the husband bought it for bought him for her. They didn't want to put any. They they weren't spending money training them. They just wanted to save him from the kill sale. And uh, I guess after a month, you know, everybody at the at that little barn was going, "Oh man, you know that's your horse." I can't believe they they sold them and so forth. Well, my trainer calls me back and she says, "Hey, you never believe it, triggers. They don't want him anymore." And I go, "Really?" And she goes, "Yeah, she's deathly afraid. Like she's." Had a rehab, and she thought that the horse therapy was going to be the deal, but she's deathly afraid to get on him. Nobody's ever rode this horse but me. Mm -hmm. So she says, do you want to buy him? Absolutely. You know, I just started out in merchant services, right? We're, we're, so you, so yeah. back up, when was that? When were you riding the horse? Was it 08? So about 08, yeah. Well, so so in, 09. in, in that area, 08. there was a bust. Yeah, we're going to go 09. So, oh, so 08. Let's back up. 08, the real estate market collapses, right? Mm -hmm. I got $8 million worth of real estate that I own. I've got rental properties, commercial buildings, all sort of multifamilies and everything. I've got an old man that was kind of my mentor in the real estate space. And he had always, he was watching me just running and gunning. And he was telling me, listen, listen, listen. Everything happens in cycles. And he says, this real estate market is going to bust. And you want to have your money stockpiled so that when it busts, you can go ahead and buy property on the cheap. Mm -hmm. That's how you be successful in real estate. He says, you don't want to keep doing what you're doing. You know, at the time, you could borrow money, I mean, on a handshake, really, from the banks. Yeah. They didn't even carry your credit. I mean, do you know somebody who has credit? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Sign here. It was so easy. So properties, the appreciation was going up 25, 30, 40, 50% in some places every year. So it's like you could buy one property or two properties, and then all of a sudden you had this massive amount of equity. Leverage that equity by two, three more. So 2008, the more so were you you were using lots of leverage to buy this. I was leveraged out. Mm -hmm. I was leveraged out. I had a construction project going that I was building a house. Um, I was in California. I'm in California, and I got this place for sale for five hundred thousand. It's like the peak price, you know, at that time. And I get an offer for 300000 on it. And I'm thinking, man, market's crashing now. I look at Connecticut. I got this construction project going down there. Market starts tanking. Florida tanking. I mean, it's just everything. I mean, cutting in half. So I start selling off everything and anything I have to get out. Because I'm mm -hmm. like, I can't refinance it, you know, at the time. It's like my livelihood was real estate. And when you're selling a lot of real estate and you got your tax returns for the last two years... Hey, that's awesome. You qualify for these mortgages. But now 2008 comes, that market's a bust. Like, you're not going to make the same amount of money you made next year and the year after. You're never going to qualify to refinance. <clears throat> so I start getting out of those. Uh, Chase Bank calls me and says, hey, we're cutting your construction line. You know, yo, it was a $200,000 construction line. I'm like, man, I'm halfway through this deal. Like, So borrow from family and friends to get myself through that deal, you know, end up end up kind of like in a in a real tough spot. Like that construction project, I had family and friends money that I had borrowed, which, you know, my word is my is my bond. I'm the type mm -hmm. of guy I want to do business on a handshake. And if I tell you, hey, I'm gonna pay you back, you're gonna get paid back, you know, maybe a little more than I than I told you, you mm -hmm. know. But uh everything's tanking and, and this deal is about to be the demise of me. You know, I'm about to go bankrupt and just Die. You're not only going to lose your investments, but your job was tied to real estate too. So you're about to lose all the income. Friends, family that had helped me out with money to get that deal done. You know, it's like, hey, I'm going to piss everybody off. It's going to hate me. I'm going to be a total piece of trash. I don't have any job to go back to or career to stay forward. It's like, we're going back to zero, you know? Yeah. So on uh, your ass again. Yeah. <laughs> so I get to California and, uh, 
I got this house for sale. I got this house for sale for like, I got this house for sale for like 800,000, right? And they're telling me, man, this house ain't going to sell. It's not going to sell for, you know, five or six. And I'm thinking, in the story, you know, I got it for sale for 800. I fly out to California, try to tie up some things up there, you know, tie up some loose ends out there and everything. And my realtor, uh, my aunt was selling the house for me. So she calls me and she says, hey, we got an offer. And I said, how much is it? The house for sale for eight. He says, uh, 500 or something, you know. Man, I'm just a different guy. Wiped out like I saw a ghost, you know. My buddy goes, man, what's the matter with you? And I said, man, I'm about to lose it all. Like, I'm in a spot. I can't get out. I can't get out of it, you know. I'm, I'm. So for the first time in my life, like, God's been there for me in my life, you know. He's been there for me. He's been there for me in a lot of times that I didn't recognize that it was him that was there for me. And I just thought, man, I got one by, I got one by, you know, but it was really him pushing me forward and, you know, helping to get me to the next place. Mm -hmm. So that night comes about to lose everything. I get down on my knees for the first time, first time in my life, probably, I mean, you know, since I'm a little kid, get down on my knees and I get to praying. I pray hard, 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 hard. Like show me a sign. You know, show me if you exist, show me a sign, something like I am, I'm done. Go to sleep, wake up next day, get a phone call about mid afternoon. My aunt says, Hey, we got another offer. I says, What is it? She goes, Full price. I go, Oh my God, you got to be kidding me. I go, Well, let's get it. And she goes, I'll be back at the office in an hour. So I said, All right. I'm going, Oh my God, hurry up, hurry up, hurry, hurry, hurry. You know, longest hour. <laughs> longest ever. hour. She gets back. She gets back and she calls me. She says, you never believe it. I got another offer. And I go, how much is that? She says, full price. So I go, oh my mm -hmm. God, I can't believe it. So I said, okay, counter them both, best and final. Now at the time when the market was hot, you'd see people offer a thousand bucks, two thousand dollars over, you know, I'm thinking it's just going to be a short little deal like that. Mm -hmm. So she says, well, the one guy's from Germany and the other guy's from Italy. They're both doctors. They both want to raise their kids in this area where the house is. And they both got a contract with Yale. Awesome. Was this your last, last yeah. house to sell? This is the last, yep. Yeah. This is the last house I thought I'd ever own. <laughs> <laughs> so the Italian comes back at 825. The German comes back at 850. 25,000, 50,000 over. So I'm thinking, wow, this is totally unreal, you know? So... The German says, uh, I want a full, you know, appraisal, inspection, the whole deal. The Italian guy says, man, I just want an inspection. And I'll close in two weeks. Boom, I'm taking the 825. Mm -hmm. you know? So get out of that deal. I've got a guy at Wells Fargo Bank, and uh, he was my lender that I was doing all sorts of big lending projects, big, 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 big stuff with. I call him up. I says, uh, Chad, what's going on? And he says, man, he goes, we just had a meeting today, and he goes, we're not lending to auto repair, restaurants. I mean, the list just went on and on. And I'm like, Chad, what are we lending to? What can we what can we do loans for? And he says, man, like self-storage units and certain like little things. And I'm like, man, that's like, now you're telling me there's no mortgage industry mm -hmm. left either, you know? And he says, man, I'm, uh, I'm actually switching departments. I'm going to merchant services. So I'm like, what the heck is that? He goes, well, you know, businesses, credit card machines, and so forth. I'm, that's an industry. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you know. Was he? Did he switch and stay with Wells Fargo? Yeah, he was a corporate guy at Wells, so he had gone over that department and uh, tried to get me on in that deal, you know. And um, I couldn't cut the mustard, you know. And you're you're an entrepreneur, you're self-employed your whole life. Like, you don't have the same opportunities that other people have. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a different deal. You know, it's a different set of qualifications you have. I mean, you can walk in and say, Hey, I built three companies and I've done this and I've worked every aspect of this business and I know it inside and out. But when I would go to try to get a job somewhere, you know, I'd always make it to the top of the, like the final interview. And then they're like, well, how are you going to fit in? How are you going to fit in with structure? How are you going to handle this? You know, it's like, dude, I, I can do anything. Like if you haven't seen my resume, I can do anything, you know, that I set my mind to, but they don't want that. You know, they want, they want that, like they want that worker be, Hey, here's a guy he's worked here for five years and he's, 
done this and done that. Like, oh, yeah. this is a perfect guy to fit in. This is a perfect employee. Mm -hmm. They don't want entrepreneurs. They want employees, you know? So, uh, anyhow, I get, uh, close up everything. I've got a desk in my garage. I get this merchant services deal. I go on some job boards now are starting to exist. And I get the first job and it's central payments is this company. And, um, uh, they send me a whole welcome pack. I get the folder and all sorts of things. And it shows you, if you do all these deals and these leases and all this stuff, you're going to make 10,000 a month. And I'm, man, I'm ready. I'm ready. Like, give me something good here. And it's residual income. So I'm like, this is cool. Like mm -hmm. I have made a lot of money in real estate, but like. You have to make a sale every time to get paid. Oh, you're only as good as your last deal, mm -hmm. you know? And I go back to vending and I'm like, wow, the vending was cool because those machines were unattended. They were always kind of working, somewhat always, passive. always making, somewhat passive, but not really. Mm -hmm. You know, you still got product and inventory and waste and you got trucks and employees and lots of, lo lots of, lots of service and stuff involved in it. Nothing really that's truly like passive, you know? Yeah. There wasn't anything that I, that I knew of that was, you know. So uh, I go through the training. They have these training calls like every single day. There's this calendar and it's like sales training at one and, you know, 11 and one and build your business, you know, all this stuff. And they're like what Zoom calls are today. Yeah. But it's a phone call. You don't see anybody and they can't, you just hear a guy talking and you know there's hundred guys on the phone. Did you have any interaction like in person with anybody from that company? Never. No, never. So uh, I've got a sales manager or relationship manager, I guess. I go through my training and that stuff and kind of think I got a grasp for what the deal is. I understand the concept of it. I don't know anything about rates. I never learned anything, you know. Just and how to talk a little bit. Pretty some, much, yeah. Some, uh, what your Terms sales pitch stuff. is, like how to get the statement. And the system was like, get the statement, fax the statement in the office, they price it. Then your sales manager calls you back <coughs> and tells you, they send you like a deal sheet, right? And the deal sheet shows you like how, how much it saves and they put a rate on it. So you get your fax comes in with your deal sheet and you're like, oh man, that makes sense. Like you don't know any better, right? Because you're green pea and you, never, you don't know. And you're like, oh wow, 1.5%, man, that, I guess that's good, you know? And she was paying 3%. Oh, heck, that's 50%, you mm -hmm. know? So I'd go in and it was a struggle. I mean, I couldn't, I, I'd spend all week, two weeks, I mean, three weeks in, I mean, you couldn't get anybody. You're walking into Main Street businesses and they're like, see ya, don't, no, we're busy, we're busy. We don't want to talk to anybody, you know? And I'm thinking, man, why is this, is this such a bad industry or what's going on? Nobody wants yeah. to talk to me. I finally get a couple little accounts and they do the deal sheet. I and you were, you were living on a couch or something? Not yet. And I wasn't there. I was still in my condo in the garage on the desk and <laughs> working on the desk. <coughs> I hadn't resorted to the couch yet. <laughs> so uh, I get like three deals. I get this little bonus spiff, like 200 bucks or whatever. So I make like 600 bucks. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm alive. You know, I'm breathing. Maybe I could get somewhere here. And uh, all of a sudden, like the following month comes by. I don't get any deals, can't sell one account, and not because I'm not working. I mean, I am pounding the pavement, like hitting 20 businesses a day. And um, like, you know, like 20 conversations a day, walking into businesses and, hey, you know, let's try trying to get something going. Nobody's breaking. So uh, month two comes by and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to be getting my little residual check. Should be like 180 bucks, 150 bucks or something at the time. And it doesn't show up. So I called. I'm like, hey, like, man, I'm starving over here. <laughs> I need that money. And they go, oh, well, you, you uh, your deal is canceled. And I, what do you mean my deal is canceled? Didn't make the quota. Yeah. They go, oh, you got to do two deals a month to get it. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, are you kidding me? So I'm <laughs> like, man, this is bad. So I'm watching the TV. I'm watching the TV in my living room and I see. My best friend's brother lives up in Orange County. I'm in San Diego. And I'm watching the news and they're raiding his office. He had this big <laughs> call center, you know, and I'm watching them raid his office and there's nobody there. And I call and I'm like, yo, dude, I just watched your office get raided on TV. He's like, oh yeah, man, we heard it was coming. We got out of there. <laughs> so I'm like, what are you going to do? He's like, man, I don't know. Like they were, they were doing auto aftermarket auto warranties. 
he's like, oh, I don't know, man, we're shut down. He's like, I got the attorney general breathing down my back and we don't know what to do. So I'm like, man, I'm on my way. Well, I'm going to come up there and visit with you. Still had the Porsche, cruise up, me and him go have lunch. And I'm like, you know, I, I got this idea. Learned a little bit about this merchant services. I actually see how it could work, but I think we need the call center you got to really make it work. So uh, he's like, man, I'm in, you know, like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, I can't afford to pay my mortgage, so I'm going to rent my place out down there. And he's like, well, come up here and live with me. And I'm like, he just got a DUI or something, you know, so he had no driver's license. He's like, well, man, I'm kind of like on. <laughs> Beneficial for both yeah, of y'all. You could drive him around. You could live with him. He's like, this kind of works for both sides here because <laughs> I, I need a driver to get me to work. And he's like, you need a place to stay. I'm like, hey, I'll cook and clean, like whatever, but I got no money. So um, literally living on the couch, you know, and uh, rent my place out just to pay the bills, get up there, and we put it together, you know, little by little. We had... I don't know what he had a call center with 160 guys in there. Was it was this your own company then, or were you working like were we? You? We were partners, so yeah. So it was me. You started and, your own merchant service company then. Yep. So we started. We started with. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know. So we went with. We found another through a mutual friend. We found another person that was in merchant services, and a friend of mine says, "Hey, well, I know this guy that's in merchant services in New York." They'll guide you. They'll show you what to do and the whole deal, and you can trust them and everything. So me and my partner uh, kind of court them for a little bit, talk to them, and they're like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, We'll give you the leads. We'll figure out, show you what to do, and, and explain it. And, uh, you know, again, no training. We knew sales. We had the tools. We had the equipment. So we get the phone dialer burning again, you know, the the calls that are like, you know, you can save money on your merchant services, press one now or whatever the whatever the catch was, was us running that stuff and started building that business up, building that business up, learning every single day, you know, because uh, it, it, they, as, as things started to evolve, like we were meeting more people, other guys that had been in the business, people that were doing bigger deals. Um, and we started just learning, you know, as we grew. So it probably was like a two-year growth period that we really started to step outside of the mom and pop business and start to understand like the online business. We, um, we started doing a lot with diet products, nutraceuticals. We had a guy that, uh, got introduced to us. He was like one of the largest online diet product guys. So just being around him, we learned that whole industry, that whole market. We got into finance, which coming from a finance background, I met guys that had a title loan business, got into the title loan side of it. So we really started to move outside of the brick and mortar everyday business that merchant service, you know, most reps only know that. So mm -hmm. we started getting into uh, the franchise level, corporate level, um, more card not present, <coughs> uh, higher risk accounts and stuff like that. So a lot it was a lot of this through networking or was it all from the call center? No, it was networking. You know, the call center was the call center was crazy in itself. Uh, you know, we were doing a lot of deals. We had 160 guys in there smiling and dialing all day. <laughs> um, it was it was multiple products, you know, so it wasn't just us. My partner had another partnership. Um, we were in a, we were in like a, a community office where it was kind of like all these businesses that got just disintegrated during 2008 market crash real estate. Everybody was trying to figure out something else. So we had this large space under the airport and we were all sharing it. So there was a good friend of mine now, he's like one of the top real estate offices, him and his wife, they had a little section over there with their guys. They were doing loan modifications. We were doing credit card processing. We started doing the merchant cash advance lending. Um, there was guys doing warranty. There was guys doing credit repair. A lot of different businesses. So I think just through that whole hub that we had and the networking within there, meeting other business owners and other guys, different ideas, that's where we really started to evolve and grow and get outside of like, hey, the Main Street business is great and the call center was great to get us there, but the attrition was high. <clears throat> you know, you're. it's kind of like if you could be the same guy that could be sold over the phone that easily, is it going to also be sold, you know, in person. So yeah. we're working on way smaller margins than we are today. Surcharge didn't exist. 
dual pricing didn't exist, uh, you know, none of that. So uh, we we get that thing going, get that thing building, and I got the horse. So I'm driving now from Orange County down to San Diego where I got the horse boarded, and I got the rodeo bug, and I'm still kind of riding around, and I drive by this ranch, and there's a sign out there, and it still up today and says from beginners to winners <laughs> San Pasqual Valley Ranch you know we got riding lessons and the whole deal so I walk in there and uh Lynn Devonport good friend of mine mentor like a father to me today still um comes out you know I I, I call him this is a funny story we laugh about it today so I call him and he's too busy you know he's got one tied up over there he's working five six horses or whatever i call and i said hey i saw the sign out there you train horses and everything and he goes yeah and i said I, I got this horse i want to bring him down for an evaluation and see if he can be a rope horse you know i don't know anything mm -hmm. and he's like oh yeah bring bring him down bring him down you know and i hear whoa whoa you know <laughs> and, and i said well how much is it he says, oh, it's nothing just bring him down bring him down you know so uh as he's bring him bring him down tuesday or something I said, all right so I borrow a trailer. I got this little old trailer. No, I sell the porch, liquidate everything, right? I'm living on the couch up there by this old, I called it Willie Brown, this old Ford F-250, like 1979, <laughs> seven three pickup. And uh, I got this little straight load bumper pull black trailer. I load a trigger in and I get wheeling over there to the ranch and bring him out. He's like, what are you doing? What's this? And I said, well, I told you, I called you last week you know, bring this horse down for evaluation. He goes, oh yeah, it's going to be 200. I'm like, whoa, you told me it was free. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> so uh, lo and behold, I drop him off that day. I get to traveling or something and I'm like, hey, I'll be back in, uh, I think I had to go back back to Connecticut or something. And, and this this guy was supposed to train him to be a rope horse? He's going to evaluate him. You know, he's going to check him out, see, see if the deal was so. So I call him about a week later. How's it going? Yeah, yeah, man, he's he could be one. You know, he's good. <laughs> okay, how much is he? You know, oh, you know, whatever, three hundred bucks a month or something like that. <sighs> Times are tight, but I was making some money. You know, not not shoot, I wasn't making nearly enough money, but I had enough. So yeah. I said, all right, we'll, we'll keep him there. Next month goes by. I'm kind of getting back on the map. I've got some business going. Everything. Had, had you started roping the dummy, or like were no, you rope doing so, anything with the rope yet? My old business partner will tell you, it's a funny story. I had a rope because I wanted a rope. Didn't know how to swing a rope, hold a rope, nothing. So his brother would run around in the front yard of our place <laughs> up in Newport Beach, and I had this rope, and I'd try to catch him. And I, I, I caught the the side mirror on my truck and ripped it off and broke it. <laughs> first, first thing you caught. First right? thing I caught. True story. <clears throat> so month goes by. I get down there, and uh, I said, man, let me see how, how that horse is doing, you know, and when he's riding him in the sorting pen and he pulls the bridle off and he's got him on his neck. Oh, look, man, he's broke. He's going riding around. Oh, my God. Wow. He's that broke. <laughs> Shoot. You know? So uh, I leave him there for another month, you know? And uh, we start getting friendly. I start going down there. I start taking riding lessons at the ranch. So Lynn's got his daughters and taking me in around pen doing. Base, you know, first we go out, hey, let me see what you know. He's like, all right, hey, let's let's back up. <laughs> let's back up and go back to the basics. So he's got me in the round pen working with the girls, doing different things. And he says, uh, what do you want to do? What's your what's your goal? You know? Said, Man, I want a rodeo. He said, Why? I said, I don't know. I think it's cool. I want to win a buckle. <laughs> he says, You want to win a buckle? And I said, Yeah. And he says, well, I got a sorting going on this week over here. He says, why don't you enter the sorting? I'm like, what's that? You know? <laughs> and next thing you know, I got this old horse Kit Kat that um, I don't even know if I'm using them as a lesson horse or renting them or whatever. And I get down there on the sorting and I got polo wraps on this horse and just total gunseled out, you know, <laughs> pointy toe boots, jeans up, you know, sitting down, your jeans are riding high and I'm out there split reining them around and. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> so uh, we get to being friends, and then I'm down there. Did you win the buckle that No, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't win it. But uh, I was going down there as much as I could. I'm fighting. I mean, the traffic's two hours there and back every day. So, I mean, the commitment's, like, unreal for me to get down there and go back. But 
I kind of have to have it. You know, it's a part of me. It's that, that part that had been missing in my life, just the connection with the horse, being out on that ranch. It's kind of felt like that's where I was supposed to be, you know, all along. Mm -hmm. So uh, I start evolving, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorting, I'm start competing, I'm doing good. I place a couple times and so forth. And there's this little double wide trailer up on the house. I mean, it looks like it should have been burned down. And uh, Lynn says to me, uh, what, what's going on? You know, we start, we're, we're close now. We get to talking about business and different things, personal life and everything. I said, man, my partner and I were splitting and going our different ways. And I'm going to take, you know, whatever this part of business can take that part of business. And then just, man, I kind of need to get down here and get closer to here. You know, this is where I want to be. And he says, okay, I got your house right there. And I look, <laughs> I go, <laughs> he goes, no, I'm not kidding you. I'm serious. I said, really? Let me see it. And we go up, it's locked, and he gets the elbow through the window and pops it. <laughs> Come on in. This place had rat shit everywhere, <laughs> water stains. I mean, I'm thinking, this guy's got to be kidding me, you know? <laughs> and he goes, I'll tell you what. He and goes, you'd built your income up a little bit. But I built so. my had built my income up, yeah. So I was, I was making some money now. And uh, he says, yeah. And I said, man, let me, let me think about it. He says, I'll pick you up tonight or meet me at the house tonight and we're, we're going to go have a steak. So I said, all right. And I'm thinking like, oh, I'm going to tell him on this. It's not for me. I'm going to go rent a place up the road or something, you know, and we go sit down and we have us a steak. And, and he says, well, it's yours. And I said, what? <laughs> yeah, I've already talked to the owner of the ranch and he said, it's yours. He won't <laughs> rent that place to anybody, but you know, cause I speak for you, you can have it. And I'm thinking, I can't live in that damn thing. You know, like, I, hey, I have lived in some worse places for a minute. But, and he goes, we're going to fix the whole place up. New floor, new part, new everything. I said, really? Oh, yeah. I said, all right. You know, next thing you know, I'm living on the ranch, you know, and I'm working. I got a little living room there. I'm kind of working out of that living room and life's good. Uh, I got trigger still in training, you know, that Palomino. I'm renting another horse. I think I bought a horse. I bought this horse, Chili, for like 2500 bucks. Turns out to be a great horse. I still have her picture picture on my wall. I mean, horse long gone, but one of those horses that like change your life forever, you know, teach you more. That horse taught me more than any trainer could ever teach you in your lifetime. You know, mm -hmm. just pick you up when you're down. I mean, always underneath you when you needed to be. I mean, just took me took me to a place I never thought imaginable. So I start winning buckles. You know, I buy chili for twenty three hundred bucks. Next thing you know, I'm I'm clicking buckles every week. And, and the roping or the sorting? Sorting. So I got this sorting deal going, and I mean, I've got it pretty dialed in. Where <clears throat> I'm winning a couple hundred bucks a week. I'm getting a buckle every you know week or whatever, and I'm kind of feeling like, man, this is this is kind of the deal. And and my buddy Jesse's going. He lives on the ranch too. He's like, man, you, you got to start roping. You got to start roping. Man, I ain't got time. You know, like I got to sort. I got to practice. I got to ride. I got to do this deal and pen in and the whole deal. And and he keeps going. Oh, you got to rope. You got to rope. You got to rope. You know, and just hadn't seen it. So we we kind of get like we get to this spot where you know my number gets raised handicap wise, and I'm kind of like. I'm living at, at, at Lynn's house every night on the ranch. There's his house and my house up there, but he pretty much took me into his family. I mean, I was I was over there, ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day of my life over there, you know, mm -hmm. that I lived on that ranch. So we we're sitting at the dinner table one night, and there's some ropings going on, and there's a sorting going on the weekend, and Lynn's kind of lining out. Me and Jesse were talking over supper, and he's like, man, where are you going this weekend? I said, man, I'm probably not going anywhere, and Jesse, where are you going? And he says, man, I'm probably not going anywhere either. And he goes, why not? I said, man, you know, I don't know. I got my number raised and kind of like, if I go here, you know, these guys are going to be there and, you know, and then these guys will be here and, you know, and then Jesse says, yeah, you know, that roping's only got this one, this number, handicap roping. And Lynn's a master of, of a subliminal message, mm -hmm. master of it, you know. He just sits back. He's just eating his steak. He says, well, you know, shit, I guess if you can't beat him, you don't think you beat him, better – Better not go, you know? <laughs> Don't say one more word. Me and Jesse walk out of that house, a couple of Coors lights in our hands, and look at each other. Oh, that son of a buck, huh? <laughs> and Jesse goes, man, you want to ride in the open tomorrow morning in the sort? And I go, hell yeah. And he goes, oh, I'm going to go roping after that. So we wake up in the morning, boom, we crack them in the, in the open sort. And I 
hit two more sortings. I'm getting paid. Jesse wins that open with me, takes off, goes to a couple jackpots. I mean, we come back at the end of the night. We're sitting back having a few beers, and we're like, hell of a day, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh, I I actually got to a point, you know, in my life there after that deal with the business. It's like business was great. I had, I had a really nice portfolio built up that I was – still building and growing, but the accounts I was getting were huge. It wasn't a lot of little mom and pops. You know, I mean, I had marinas and some Fortune 500 companies, a lot of big title loan finance companies. So, I mean, I I was processing millions of dollars every single month. I was loving the ranch life so much over there. And um, it got to the point where, you know, I started getting a little bit too cocky, you know, thinking, man, I know everything, you know. (laughs) And, uh, my horse wasn't working for me, you know, but it was me not working for the horse. You yeah. Know? So, you know, me and Lynn kind of butt heads one night and I'm like, hey, you know, so-and-so's coming down and he's a world champion reiner and everything. And uh, let's let's get him to evaluate this horse tomorrow and see what he thinks wrong with him. You know, well, hell, that pissed him off. <laughs> you think I don't know how to train one? I'll put you on one. You'll fall off. You know, <laughs> so show up down here in the morning six o'clock, you know, so I go show up down there at six o'clock and I'm, everybody, all the girls, they got their head down, just looking up at me like he's going to put me on the rankest <laughs> son of a buck there ever was, you know, and get out there and I kind of get ragdolled around a little bit on this horse and hang in there and we're done. And he turns to me and he says, man, I'll tell you what, you need to come work for me. And I said, really? And he says, yep, you got to ride a lot of horses. If you want to get to where you want to get and be where you want to be. You got to ride a lot of horses, you know, and I'm sure you heard of it, you know, the law of 100, right? If you spend 18 minutes a day doing anything, you know, in one discipline, you'll be better than 95% of the people in that discipline. And that was my, that was my law of 100 or rule of 100 experience right there. So, I mean, every single day I got up and I rode 10 and they weren't the good ones, you know, (laughs) and, uh, Come back for lunch. I mean, I'd ride this old, I forget this, I forget this sorry sucker's name, but I mean, I'd have lunch and come back and have to ride him. And this sucker, I mean, he bucked around and hopped around and the roughest ride. I mean, you didn't even want to eat lunch before riding him, you know? <laughs> were you just kind of, were these just like colts to get rode or they were out, sorting horses? Yeah, so they were all out. So we had a bunch of boarders there. So they were all outside horses or some that, some that were boarders horses that were just, you know, lopers out there exercising. Some that were in training, so we'd go sword on them. Um, there were some people outside that bring horses in, so they had a full, we had a full cutting arena. So I do turn backs, learn how to ride the cutters. You're just doing everything. Just do everything. Uh, I finally got to a point one year where I just got the bug, and I was like, man, I'm going to I'm gonna hit the road. I'm sorting, I'm, I'm doing good, I'm winning everything, like in Southern California, and at my level, like I want to go and see what else is out there. So I just packed up one night and hit the road during Reno Rodeo and shot out to Reno. They had a sort in there. I ended up out in Casper, Wyoming, Colorado, just Montana. It's kind of covered all up up in there. And I started clicking, you know, just went in and making And you friends. had the, the merchant services was paying, your residuals yep. were paying for this lifestyle you are yep. getting. Yeah, merchant services was doing it. So it was interesting, the, the business aspect of it, you know, I – I have another brand I started kind of during that time, Western Payments. I'd be on the road traveling. I got to knowing so many people, you know, and I'd see a truck go by and all of a sudden, man, who the heck is that? Call him up. Hey, bud, you know, what are you doing? Oh, I'm heading up to, you know, whatever rodeo. What are you doing up there? Oh, I got the product. We're selling this deal. Who are you using for credit cards? Oh, that's what I do. I started building that business, you know, mm-hmm. building that business. And then little by little, it was like the sorting producer started using me. And then the team roping producer started using me. The barrel racing producer started using me because there was really nobody around that anybody knew or trusted. So it's like, you know how it is, right? In in in, in our world now, I mean, you want to do business with people that you know, like, and trust. And in the mm-hmm. cowboy world, it's even more so that. I mean, yeah. nobody's, nobody's – you're going to call your best buddy. If you're going to put on a rope in tomorrow and you got a buddy that's been putting on ropings, you're going to call him and say, hey, how are you getting those credit card payments done? You're not going to call mm-hmm. Square or – go Googling around for it. So I started building that business. So I was still growing that whole division, you know, during that time. So I get out to Casper, Wyoming and uh, 
this guy's got a ranch up there, real expensive cutting horses. We're cutting in the barn and stuff. And then he's got a rope and dummy out there and a sled and a rope. And I'm like, heck, let's, let's try this roping deal. <laughs> Man, that was it. And I tell you, I roped that dummy two, three times. I come back and I said, Man, I'm roping. He goes, What? And I said, Yeah. He goes, Well, we better take a we better take a look at what you got going on here. <laughs> so we start going down the path of just, you know, like everybody, let's rope the sled every day, all day. Let's, you know, just rope uh just, you know, rope them out of the box, a couple lopers and stuff, and we'd have a jackpot every Saturday morning and I start entering this jackpot. And I mean, <laughs> he, I think Lynn was away, and they called him after that jackpot. <laughs> a bunch of guys called him, and he calls me. He's like, hey, buddy. He's like, we got to back off. <laughs> you can't enter anymore. <laughs> Did we get to work on your handle a little bit, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, is it that bad? And he's like, oh, yeah, these guys are saying you're fixing to lose your hand, you know? <laughs> <I'm> like, just... <laughs> No, no, no etiquette at all, you know, just hook them and turn. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was, that's kind of where that, where that whole deal went. And from that, from that point on, I mean, it's just been amazing. You know, I spent, spent as much time learning how to rope as I did learn how to sort, you know, mm -hmm. end up moving here to Stephenville. I was hauling horses on the side for the girls that I'd been traveling and rodeoing with and, they end up in Stephenville. Stephenville end up kind of coming here, and and it was uh it was a different experience for me than than anything. It kind of took me back to my childhood again in the sense that like everything was closed on Sunday. You know, people went to church. I mean, you go to the dry cleaners one day and you show up there again. They knew you by name. Mm -hmm. You do business on handshake, and I was like, wow, this is back like, in small town America. Yeah, so I was like, this means something. You know, this is where I want to raise a family. This is where I want to be. This is the people I want to be around. So came down here and uh I was roping okay, you know, not not great by any means at the time, but I was roping okay and can, had a bunch of horses, five, six horses. It was decent enough to get around and do what I needed to do, you know. And by this time you'd you'd built your, your payment deal up pretty good. Built my payment deal up. So yeah, built my payment deal up a lot. Once I moved back here, so I moved back here to Stephenville. And then just start going full force again, you know, single-handedly really like solopreneur, start building. You know, I'm back out networking. I'm really moving more in that space. I got saddle makers, trailer sales guys. I mean, that whole Western world really kind of pulled me in and trusted me. Did, well, so when did you start Diversified? When did when did Diversified start? So Diversified about? started probably about uh, 2017, 2018. And was it like, had you, when did you move to Stephenville? Moved to Stephenville about 2012. So before, like you were doing Western payments and then, mm -hmm. and then, uh, now you're, now you're doing diversified. Yep. So I had, so I still had a piece of, uh, you know, first source merchant services, that company that I had there. I had business that I had built from then that was still kind of going under that brand. I had Western payments, which was everybody in the Western world. Mm-hmm. And uh, I end up reconnecting with Melissa, who my partner now. Mm -hmm. Melissa worked for the very first company that I had told you about. You know, we went. She was an office admin for them, or yeah. office manager for them. So we had a relationship. We knew each other from back then. Um, she stayed in the payment space. She got involved in some fintech companies. We kind of reconnected. Gosh, probably about 2015 or so, and she was working for another ISO. So uh, we stayed in touch, and you know she sits on the board for the Northeast Acquirer Show. Just super savvy, you know, in the industry knows everybody. Learned a lot over the years. Uh, we got to talking more and more and more, and I finally just one day said to her like, "Hey, listen, you know what? You're you're always job hopping, looking for the next place to go work, the next fintech company." She had been at a company that like wasn't really going anywhere. They had a lot of capital, a lot of investors you know, put money in. I was at a point where I needed help. So I was like, hey, I need some help. She starts helping me out. And I'm like, why don't you think about taking a leap and becoming an owner mm -hmm. and starting an ISO? She's like, I don't know. And I'm like, like take, like, I, this is what we'll do. I'll start diversified payments with you. Everything that I have, my stuff I've built over the years and stuff, obviously going to be mine, but we'll start diversified from scratch. Let's build up an agent team. Let's put out, put everything that we know together and let's really do something different 
and and grow something good. So she lives in New York. I was living here in Texas, and Brody was uh, Brody was probably like the third guy that we brought on, you know, at the time. <laughs> That's so, cool. Yeah, we had a couple guys in California that we knew, and uh, Brody came on, and and the rest was pretty much history. You know, we've grown that deal virtually. We get together a couple times a year to kind of have our powwows constantly. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, we're always on a some type of a Google Meet call and so forth to build it. Yeah, and I know um, at some point in there in your merchant services deal, um, since it's residual, you were saying you were you were you were living on the ranch or whatever, and you were rodeoing and sort and and going hard in the horse deal, and never had to work. And guys are asking you like. What yeah. the hell are you doing? You yeah. never go to work. You never do anything else. You're just out yeah. entering and doing all yeah. this stuff. You're like, hey man, I built a, I already built my income up, and uh, yeah, no. I mean that's that's a cool thing about the payment industry, merchant services industry. Um, we get to help business owners. We're usually are saving them money, you know, giving them better service, but also it, it allows us to live live this lifestyle and and get to rope and kind of be involved in, with horses and go go do that yeah yeah that's the beauty of it yeah it's funny i, I was always buying and trading horses and <laughs> always going you know yeah. people would show up to the ranch and i was there during the day i'd have a trailer coming and going they'd pass me on the road and they are are you like in the cartel or something <laughs> are you a drug dealer yeah no are you in the witness protection program or something <laughs> no what do you do i'm like this is what i do you know yeah um, you, you never work you never work you know <laughs> How the times have changed, though. You know, now I got a family, and as you know, you know, you've got a family starting out now. I mean, the responsibilities kick in, and uh, mm-hmm. my son was two on his second birthday. It was the last year that I really was out there rodeo, and I was roping calves and team roping. And we get out to Goshen, Connecticut, and my son won his first buckle. <laughs> and I got this picture of him with his back number on and his shaps on, and his first little buckle he ever won at a, at yeah. a deal, and it was. Awesome. But now, you know, you start thinking and the priorities are different, right? Single guy, it's like, hey, I'm building the business. I'm freewheeling. I'm roping all night, all morning, traveling, going where I want and working out of a living quarters trailer. Mm-hmm. You know, it was my office. And now with a family, man, I'm, I'm as you know, you know, I'm in the <laughs> office now. I'm, a, yeah. I'm, a, I'm an office guy. <laughs> yeah. It allows you to, you're working in the office and staying home and spending more time with your family. Yeah. The rodeo piece has been awesome for me too. You know, we've evolved and do so many rodeos, so many jackpots, so many producers. We're behind a lot of the software now that exists that people use. Um, so my wife always says, man, don't you miss it? Don't you want to go back and jackpot <laughs> or enter again? I'm like, yeah, I do. But we got so much business happening on every weekend that like I have got to be on standby for when a phone call yeah. you know, comes in. And fortunately, they're far and few. But, you know, if it's a Saturday rope and there's – 500 teams entered, you know, and and I mean, we all know how many teams there could be in the course of the day, a couple thousand teams. It's like, better get it fixed right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what I love about uh, working with y'all. It's uh, if, if something arises and I have a question, like somebody, if a business has a problem and they call me or text me and I don't know the answer to help them, I, I can call you or text you and we can we can get it back. And, you know, get back to them and help them right then, whether it's, you know, six o'clock at night or five o'clock in the morning or Saturday or Sunday or whatever it is. It's pretty cool. Um, So let's talk about diversified a little bit. What when y'all built that, like what a, let's talk about all the services we offer. Uh, obviously, credit card processing is the main thing. And then we can help businesses in like so many different ways. Talk the, yeah. the lending, the checks. Well, you know, so you got credit payment processing, you know, really it's a, a a lot in there. I mean, now you've got your credit card processing and you got ACH processing, which a lot of business owners don't even know is an option for them. Mm-hmm. And ACH is an awesome option for some businesses, uh, especially businesses that are taking payments over the phone or doing invoicing. It takes the guesswork out of getting paid with a check. Yeah. If it's hot or not. It, yeah. It takes the guesswork out of, of that, the, checks in the mail is it going to show up but also it's you can process those checks for a fraction of the cost of a credit card you mm-hmm. know um yeah a lot of the other stuff that we have in there i mean we go as far as a digital wallet right so we've got a digital wallet that could be used which is similar to paypal mm-hmm. uh money pays in and you can pay out through the digital wallet i think you're going to see that 
you're going to see that start to evolve in the rodeo space really soon. We've got a project in the works and the team rope in where two teams are going to be able to enter. That payment's going to run through the digital wallet and then it'll actually go into the into the draw, you know, mm -hmm. from there. But at the same time, the producer will have the option to pay you out via that digital wallet instead of having to bankroll cash and pay you out with the cash. So new technology, really cool technology on that side of it. But uh, payment wise, yeah, listen, the basics, right? Everybody, you've got your, your in-store, your online, your mobile uh, payment solutions, which are available for any business. I think that the thing about credit card processing, you know, when I think about it and when I think about diversified payments, we're different and we want to be different in the, in the way that we want to have a more consultative approach with the business owners when it comes to the sales process. People get turned off because they had a bad experience with credit card processing at some point in their life. Yeah. They probably get more phone calls today than they do customers of people trying to tell them, I could lower your rate, lower your rate, lower your rate. So people get standoffish. But the big, big picture is a business has to get paid. How mm -hmm. a business gets, getting paid is the lifeblood of any business. Yeah, if you don't get paid, you don't have a business. Yeah, you don't get paid, a lot, you, don't, you don't keep the lights on. So how you get paid is should be the first and foremost important thing of any business. What happens from that payment process right there, the savings that you can you know obtain through different pricing models that we have, whether it be the surcharge or dual pricing, there's a lot of money that's left. So, you know, the consultative approach, I believe in selling merchant services, let's look at the whole picture, right? You're a business owner. There's things that you need to do or should be doing. You're a, you're a father, a mother, a, you know, you've got a family there. You got to look at the big picture, you know, do you, are you working for the business or is the business working for you? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of businesses are just, you know, like we've talked about, Hey, you get up and you're running the race. Like you turn, you you turn the key, you turn on the lights, and it's like the phone's ringing, customers come and go, and before you know it, it's like the things that you say, "Hey, I'm going to do that tomorrow. I'm going to do that next week." Like years go by, right? Mm -hmm. You make your resolution, still never gets done. But there's a lot of things that are important, you know. So if you're a business owner, I mean, at some point, what's your what's your end game? You want to sell your business? Well, to sell your business, you need to have a valuation on your business. Your valuation is is based on your profitability of your business. So if your expenses, like your merchant processing, are so high, I mean, that's going to lower your valuation because you've got all that, you know, added expenses. Mm -hmm. If you could go ahead and, and eliminate that right there, you're increasing your valuation, increasing the worth of your business alone. Yeah, I mean, if you're saving a thousand dollars a month on your processing and in your credit card fees, and you're twelve thousand a year, and somebody's going to buy your business based on that profitability that 12,000 a year times I'm like what do you buy a business on three years or something probably so yeah. you could get 36,000 you know more dollars for your business when you sell it as opposed to if you're paying those higher fees so sure. 36,000 and selling a business I mean you could do something with that you know even you, if you're not going to sell it you you're still lot, you would still save 36,000 a lot of money you know and and we see uh you know, I saved a business recently $300,000 a year. I mean, it's a real number, mm -hmm. real number. But uh, even when you go down and you look at the smaller savings, right? Let's say it's 500000 bucks, $2,000. I mean, small, it's a great number. What does that business owner have going on right now towards their retirement, you know? Mm -hmm. Are they fully funding their Roth IRA? Because they don't have a 401k. They got to create it themselves. Mm -hmm. Do they have a, you know, if they've maxed out their Roth IRA, do they have a SEP? You know, a SEP IRA, now you could put even more money away, you know, uh, tax deferred mm -hmm. or pre-tax or whatever it is. So, I mean, those additional things, I mean, that's why you're in business. You know, you're in business to create a better life because you're passionate about something. You want to have a better future for your family and, and you want to create wealth. Mm -hmm. So you've got to use the tools. And if that, if the ability to save that amount of money is available to you at your fingertips, you've got to be able to show these business owners, and they have to understand, you know, the big picture. Hey, we're not just talking about saving some money here and putting it in your pocket. Like, really think about how you could utilize that money to grow and make it make more sense to you. Here's how you're going to fund your retirement. Here's how you're going to fund your college tuition for your kids. Different things that are important, those milestones, like they're, they're going to happen and you're not going to be prepared. So there's no better time than now to take advantage of 
saving that money and applying it towards some something else that's going to get you ahead. Mm -hmm. And and you've you've built your portfolio up, and and we were just talking the other day. You joined a mastermind. You're you're going to the gym. You're you're still you're still developing. You're still on a yeah. personal growth story. So yeah. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah. Then you know we go back if we rewind this podcast. We go back to the vending machine gangster. Yeah. To the surfer, to the cowboy. You know, right? So there's there's this evolution. You mm -hmm. know, and I think you're always learning. You know, you should always be learning and always trying to be a better version of you. So you know now. As a father, you know, new father and stuff, it's like, yeah, you let a, lot, a lot of things get in the way. You know, I don't have the free time that I used to have to go rope, jackpot, work out, stay in shape. You start start to realize that, like, I'm not going to put off to tomorrow, you know, what I can do today. So I kind of made made that hard promise to myself. It's kind of a funny story. I think about it every year. Hey, I'm going to get in shape, and I'm going to do this and do that. But it was a uh, day before New Year's, and I went – I've got this little – kind of road around us that I walk on. It's about two miles. I drove it out and I'm walking on it and I look down and there's a dollar like in this little dirt puddle on the side of the road. Just this <laughs> dirty old dollar. You come in the office, you'll see it's pinned up on the board. And uh, I saw that dollar. So I just kind of started this this group I was listening to and you know the message, right? Your health, your wealth and your networks, your net worth, all this stuff. And, and I look down and I see that dollar and I was like, you know what? I'm walking right now. I'm like getting healthier. I'm want to get healthier. Like my health is my wealth. That dollar was that symbol to me. So I picked that dollar up and I pin it up on the board and I look at it every single day now as that motivation to reaffirm. Like, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. You're, you know, you're out exercising and then you, you made a buck off of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I saved it. <laughs> um, You've so, been doing the same. You've been, you've been working out and, and kind of went down that path too. How does that make you feel? Yeah. It's, um, really i guess like turning 30 and then having a kid and everything i finally started maturing a little bit thinking about the future a little bit and uh yeah i i always tied my identity to being somewhat athletic being able to do you know different things and uh, started slipping a little bit on that so uh last year i was like i'm joining the gym and it has been awesome. I mean, I go to the gym, I listen to podcasts, listen to audibles. Uh, it's just as much. I, I I used to think this was all bullshit. You know, everybody said, man, I went for running. I feel great. Like <laughs> running is, no, that's stupid, you know? Yeah. And, um, and people talk about the, the mental side of working out. And I'm like, that's stupid. No way. You're going out and working and sweating. There's, there's no way that it helps you mentally, but it's just as much mental for sure as it is physical. I'm, I'm getting in a little bit better shape physically, but uh, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm listening to audibles. I'm learning while I'm doing it, and just going there, and it's it's like an hour to myself in there, you know. And uh, yeah, I mean, f physically and mentally, it, it helps for sure. Uh, and you feel better about yourself. Um, you start looking better, you know, feel yeah. better. So it it all goes together. Um, like I said, reading books, listening to podcasts. You're just trying to grow, grow mentally, and and learn about business, and and uh, bettering myself physically and mentally. It's it's a cool deal. Yeah, I'm new to the podcasting deal. I just started this year. Yeah, um, I'm like a prehistoric man, you know, when it comes to technology. <laughs> but uh, I I absolutely love it, you know. And mm -hmm. I think you're the one who kind of inspired me because you're always sharing a podcast that you listen to or a clip from something in in our conversation. So I started looking around and I think, you know, once you find what you're looking for, you know, mm -hmm. the, the people that you want to listen to and what's, uh, it, it changes everything, you know, a mm -hmm. mile walk or run turns into two miles pretty easily, you know, yeah. because you're so interested in listening to what's happening. And lots of times, you know, you can relate yeah, you to that stuff. It. Yeah. You get lost in it. And, uh, you know, I think it's Patrick bet David, or I, I think it was him. who says, uh, sometimes on your, Waiter, sometimes you know you get lost on the way to a dream and find a bigger one. Mm -hmm. You know, and I absolutely love that message. Um, I love that message that I that I got from a podcast. Another one, which I've got on my board in the office, which I just man, I'm gonna have this thing made and put on like my son's over the door. <laughs> and it, it was uh, Tim Tebow, 
and um, talking about training, you know, and, and always trying to be prepared to be better, you know. And he, his dad had over his door when he was a kid, it said, somewhere he is out there training. And when we meet, he will win. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, can you imagine waking up and seeing that every single day, just that little message subliminally even, you know, yeah, that's in there. I look at it every single day in my office and it makes me think harder to like, be better. Like mm-hmm. I want to learn more. I want to provide more value to my family, to my customers, to my team, uh, you know, and, and really try to be the best that I can be. So yeah, that's the new year, new version, yeah. you know, better version of me. And who knows what next year, next year brings, you know? Yeah. And the, I'm hoping this will be kind of a vehicle to, to merge, to merge business and to merge the cowboy culture and the Western culture, because I, I started listening to podcasts because of Shady and I thought they were dumb. I, I love music. So I always listen to, you know, music driving down the road and stuff. And she, she got to driving and we were listening to Cow Horse Full Contact and I got to listening to it. I mean, I love hearing people tell stories and stuff, sitting around telling stories and that's what it was. And so I, I went back and I listened to every episode and caught up on that. And I was like, what am I going to listen to now? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I just started looking on my podcast app and, um, I found I found Bradley dropping bombs, and I'm like, this guy looks kind of cool. And I scrolled through there, found something that looked interesting, and and listened to that. And I'm like, this this guy's pretty cool. So I started listening to all those, and I would go through there, and I would skip all the sell stuff, and, and kind of just skip through what I you know. Well, I listened to all of them. Same deal. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll go back and listen to these other ones. And holy crap, if those ones that I skipped were not the ones that I needed to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. On, I'm like, I'm never going to be in sales, whatever. And I went back and listened to those, and and people had some of those people that I never heard of, I would listen to them, and they had awesome stories and opened my eyes uh, to new businesses and and new ways of doing things, new perspectives. And so, so that's one thing, like, you got to have an open mind, and I'm hoping, like, this will this will – show people to maybe introduce people to new ways of doing things, new perspectives, new businesses, just like the credit card processing, new opportunities, and uh, you never know what you're going to find out there. Yeah, I agree. I think you're doing a great job at it. And I think that, um, you know, if anybody gets anything out of this podcast that we're talking about, like anything's possible, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. not a kid that Grew up with anything, you know. You I went against the grain every step of the way. Every way, <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody handed me the playbook. Nobody said, "Hey, come on in. Here's the family business. Here's the company." It's just like, yeah, you know, it's the, it's the hard work. It's the drive. It's the motivation. And uh, I love seeing people like yourself. I mean, you're on fire. You know, you're doing all the right things, um, and you're you're building a great business, and you got a beautiful family. And I love to see more people take advantage of this opportunity. Cause I think mm-hmm. there's so many people out there that don't know about this business and mm-hmm. understand what it is. And they're, they're pressed, right? Like, Hey, I've got to, I've got to have a nine to five job. I can't just cut loose yeah. and, and take a whole career change and be on a commission only deal, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I had to do that. I took the leap. I, w- I was pretty comfortable. Um, you know, I was riding outside horses, working at the sale barn day work and staying busy. And I said, after Lottie was born, I, I took the month off from the sale barn and then I, I never went back and I was like, I'm I'm quitting that. I day work a little bit still, but I was like, I'm I'm taking a leap. I'm finding a new way to make money that has more scalability, a mm-hmm. new way to do business in it, and I can build a life for my for myself and my family and and then finding this with the recurring revenue and, and building being able to build that up and then then go live that life, go rope and day work and rodeo and, you know, take Lottie to rodeos and Shady go to the horse shows and all yeah. that. Yeah, I want to ask you some, some wrap up questions. So like we talked about your, your, you know, new year, new me, uh, personal development deal. What are some daily habits? Like some kind of like you're doing it every day, no matter what are yeah. you, are you reading or eating something? Are you, um, you're gonna exercise you're gonna you know listen to something yeah so uh i've i've been year to date right now 2024 i've been on the 30 30 30 uh which is i think tim ferris or gary brecca one of those guys the four-hour body Mm -hmm. Uh, 
And it's 30 grams of protein within the first 30 minutes of waking up, followed by 30 minutes of exercise. I do it every single day, seven days a week. Um, I have cut out, you know, usually I'm a, I'm a bacon, egg, potato, get up, couple cups of coffee and so yeah. forth. And I've changed that pattern. And I get up, I drink water sometimes with my electrolytes. I go right to the hydration before I go to coffee. Immediately go to that shake. That shake deal, um, and it's nothing special, right? I just I go to... HEB and I get a 30 gram protein shake one that I like. I don't mm -hmm. even, I, I couldn't tell you the name of it, mm -hmm. but uh, I like it. It works for me and I'm not hungry. I'm not craving anything. I mean, yeah. I get, get, and, and I feel great. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you start kind of towards the end of the year, the holidays. I mean, you're, you're kind of squeezing and yeah. get that, get that, <laughs> get them jeans buckled. Yeah. You know, or you got your big belt buckle on and you could pop a button behind it to yeah. get a little breathing room and, I don't need that anymore. So even just in that short amount of time, what are we, the 22nd of the month, mm -hmm. 23rd? I mean, in 23 days, like I've already noticed a massive amount of difference where my shirts aren't feeling as tight, my jeans I could button and sit down comfortably. Like, And and, and I'm the type of guy, like I keep an inventory of jeans. You know, I've got yeah. 34s, 35s, 36. <laughs> I even got a pair of 38s, like emergency. Just in case. Yeah, and, I've, and it's like I got to the 38 one day, not too long ago, and I was kind of like, man, these are kind of feeling too comfortable. You know, and <laughs> that was part of the inspiration. Like, I gotta, I gotta change. You know, yeah. Especially, you know, being a father, right? You got your kids, and you know what it's like to enjoy them. And mm -hmm. you just think, like, now I think, man, I want to live forever. Mm -hmm. You know, like I want, I want to live forever. You know, yeah. I don't want to miss a day. So, uh, yeah, the thirty, thirty, thirty. That's for me. Um, the other thing I do is I've been getting up at five o'clock in the morning. So. You know, I, I told you before we started here, I used to laugh at guys, man, these guys go to the gym at five o'clock in the morning and, and working out that I'm like, that's a joke, man. It's not a joke, you know? Mm -hmm. And I also was a guy that I, I hated getting up early. Yeah. It just was not for me. But you know what? I mean, what do they say? 20 days or something like that is that you, know, you start to form a habit and it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, my wife's super supportive. She's up, she, you know, she knows I'm getting up. So she's getting up at that time too. So she'll usually wake me and poke me if I'm, if I'm not up at, mm -hmm. at that time, but now it's like my body clock's already kind of reset itself and I'm going to bed a little bit earlier because it's like, what are you, what's really on TV? You know, you're staying yeah. up late. I mean, I spend an hour flicking through the channels trying to find something to watch or it's a rerun of some rodeo mm -hmm. that I saw 22 times. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's like the, the speed you're Williams time, reel basically. from back in, yeah, whatever. And, uh, it's like, you know what? So I, I get up at five. I usually read about 30 minutes. Um, I try to at least read for 30 minutes. That's probably the hardest thing to stay committed to just because um, the way things work out, you know. But, mm -hmm. the, but the protein shake, that deal is for me. Every single morning I get out and do my 30 minutes at least. Now it's probably a little bit more than that. But that's how I'm starting my day every single day. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I've done is I've, I've gotten more organized with a calendar, you know, and before it's like, a, I'm, a, I'm a notepad guy. I'm always writing mm -hmm. down on a notepad, like yeah. to do this and flipping pages and stuff. And I started using that Calendly calendar app and just booking my time on that. And, you know, I don't know if I offended people, you know, by sending them my link saying, Hey, you know, book me on this, but it helps me to stay organized. Yeah. And it also helps me to be prepared for, Hey, if, if I know that you're booking that time and you're on there, like, I'm going to be more prepared to talk to you about that and and isolate that time mm -hmm. to give you 100% of my time, you know, in that time slot yeah. versus like catch me off guard when I'm thinking about five other things. So yeah. my my personal organization and that stuff and and the other part, those are those are probably two of the biggest changes I've I've had so far. What so you said reading, what are your what's like three of your favorite books? They can be business or they can be, you know, whatever. And I am all business and systems. So uh, I am reading a book uh, right now, Your Next Five Moves by mm -hmm. Patrick Bed David, who's one of my all-time favorites. I mean, I love the guy. If you haven't followed him on a podcast or seen him on social media or something, I mean, you can listen to that guy for hours. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, lock me in a room. I yeah. want to hear more. I mean, he's he's pretty amazing guy. Um, I've got another book now called, uh, oh, my God, Traction. Uh, and Traction is a book about systems. And I like Traction a lot. It's not like a super exciting book to read, but it really does help to get organized. You know, it's easy to start a business. Mm -hmm. You go get your, your EIN number and that stuff, and it's like, hey, I'm in business, man. I, 
this is the deal. But in, until you really, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of evolving now, right? So diversified payments is, it's a business, but I'm trying to build diversified payments into a company, you mm -hmm. know, where really we have the structure in the sense of these are the departments. This is the way the system works. System and processes. System and processes in place to be more efficient to and to help people and to scale, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what traction's all about. Really. It's got a lot of like real helpful little worksheets in there. It was interesting. The first one I did, I'm like, I was like at a zero and I'm thinking like, oh, man, <laughs> I'm going to be like high score on this deal. And I'm going through and I'm like, wow, like I really need this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are, those are two, those are probably two of the favorites I've got. Um, I think it's the 5 a.m. clubs in there. I haven't cracked that open, but I did listen to it on Audible. So mm -hmm. Audible, I liked. Um, I listened to a couple on Audible, and then I actually bought the hard copy to read the whole deal. Yeah, I like doing both. And then Tony Robbins has a new one coming out, which I'm super excited to check out. I'm just about done with uh, the full audio book on, on mastering money, I think it yeah, is. Yeah, Money Master the Game. Yeah, and that, that thing's like 20 hours on oh, Audible man. or something. It's yeah, crazy. it's so long. <laughs> it's so long. <clears throat> it's so long, but I mean, it's one of those deals where like, you know, you're constantly hitting that little rewind, you know, 15 seconds yeah. every two minutes. And my phone, the notes in my phone, I mean, I'm like, I'll be walking or running or doing something and then I'm like, stop and try to type it and copy it and yeah. like make all these notes on it. Cause it's like, God, I don't want to forget this, you know? And I, uh, Patrick bet David was talking about his books, you know, he's read like over 1500 books and he's like, you know, you could read a lot of books and just because you read the books doesn't mean you yeah. got anything. Her Mosey says the same thing. It doesn't yeah. mean anything if you don't learn anything. Yeah. And he's like, you have to study them. So he's like, you know, I'll get one book and I'll read it and I'll highlight it and do things and go back and read it again two, mm -hmm. three times and study it. And that's kind of where I am right now with, um, you know, your next five moves. I'm a, I'm a page bender. I'm always like bending the page. So if you yeah. ever see a book that I had, there's pages <laughs> bent on all sides of it, but you know, you, you, you got to go back and try to figure what was it. So yeah, I've got a highlighter there now. And I'm, what about a podcast? Like what's your favorite your go-to podcast and one. ed ed my show mm -hmm. uh i did not think i was going to be a fan of the ed my show i listened to his reel at the end of 2023 where he had short clips with a lot of guys on there blew me away mm -hmm. i mean i was like i mean there was parts of it that i was like so excited and happy there were parts i mean i was wiping a tear from my eye i was yeah. emotional you know there was a lot of good stuff on it and i think that's the thing i like about the podcast the most is that you really hear authentic, genuine stories mm -hmm. of adversity and triumph and things that I can relate to of being in those situations. So lots of times, you know, it's listening to a podcast and hearing somebody else's story that takes me from the dream I was on to a to a bigger one. You know, it's yeah. propelling me forward because now I'm seeing the picture so much more clearly in a bigger view of what, you know, I may have had lasered in this tight little focus. I'm like, this is where I want to get, and this is how to get there. And then you start hearing somebody else's story, and you're like, wow, it's much easier than I thought, you know, or it's mm -hmm. much bigger, you know, um, deal than I thought it was going to be. What what kind of advice would you give somebody that's that's looking for something that's that's kind of down and out, um, whether that be their income or just not happy with their life, like, like you said in your story, uh, you know, you're making a lot of money at one point, but you still weren't happy until you found the horses. But somebody that's just like down and out, what, what would you tell them to do? Like, Well, I'll tell you what, I think that I think that no matter what your situation is, you have to look in the mirror and you have to look at yourself in the mirror and you have to say, I'm amazing. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you can do anything that you set your mind to it. You know, I'm a perfect example of that. I mean, I'm a guy that, didn't know how to surf, didn't grow up surfing, learn how to surf, didn't never rode a horse, learn how to rodeo and actually go and win checks at professional rodeos. You mm -hmm. know, um, I never played hockey growing up as a kid in high school or anything. Got six, turned 16, set my mind on learning how to play hockey. I made, made the cut on a division two hockey team in college for the one semester I went. So it's like, you know, the, the proof's there. It's just whatever you can do, whatever your situation is. I mean, you got to get laser focused on on doing something, you know, mm -hmm. and no matter what it is, even if it's the littlest thing that moves you forward. I mean, if you're a 600-pound person that's overweight, it's like, yeah, you want to lose, you know, 400, 500 pounds 
tomorrow, but it's not going to happen. You know, take the small steps. And I think everybody has to start to, to look, you know, the other thing that's important, it's like, we're in a microwave age now, right? So it's like, hey, let me hit this for 30 seconds or a minute and I got popcorn, you know, and mm-hmm. that's how fast it is. But time fixes and heals everything, no matter what it is, you know, and and you have to be patient. You, that The patience is, is key. Mm-hmm. What you're doing today with your diet and, and your training and everything, I mean, that's awesome, right? You, you're starting to see results now, but imagine the results that you're going to see in, in six months, you know, in a year, and at the same time, if all of a sudden, you know, next month you fall off for a month, it's like, hey, you got to get back and, and and start back up, you know? And Yeah, I, th- I think like uh, like you're saying, nobody wants to commit. They, they're like, they try something, they try MLM or they try going to a new job or whatever and try it for a month. And then they're like, oh, that thing don't work. That's a scam. And uh, they're just looking for something fast. I've, <clears throat> and I've been that way before. And still can kind of catch myself doing that, but um, I try to commit myself to a year. Like when I join the gym, I'm like, I'm going to give it a year. We'll we'll see what happens. If I still like it, we'll we'll keep going. If not, then reevaluate. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to try this diet, and we're going to try it for a long period of time. I'm going to. Uh, I gave the insurance deal a run. I'm still involved in it, not as much after I found this and like this. Um, I'm pretty sure I know where I'm going to be, you know, after the year mark, but. In a year, like if it wasn't working, I wasn't happy. Let's let's reevaluate, but give give it the time to work. Um, and I've heard, I don't remember who originally said it, but I I know Alex Ramosi has said it too. But it's uh, talking about getting rich, making money. Compound interest and time is what makes people wealthy. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> just doing a, doing a little bit, putting a little money aside, or m- making a little bit in increments like in increasing a little bit in time is is how you're going to get there so it's it's just it's hard to have the patience um but but just taking those little steps every day to to get closer and just keeping the end goal in mind but saying that looking at those little wins and saying you know i got a little bit closer today i did this i did this what happens if you get bucked off a horse? <laughs> you got to get back on. That's right. <laughs> and I live by that. You yeah. know, it's, uh, you get bucked off, you get back on. I learned that. And uh, I never forget, I get bucked off. I'm on riding a cutting horse. And well, they thought it was a cutting horse, I guess. I don't know what showed up. They go, hey, get on, you know. And, and uh, this horse broken too, you know. And as, I, as I, I get bucked off and come off, I mean, it's, Hind lane comes through and kicks right through my jeans and mm-hmm. my butt cheek is like the size of a pumpkin. I, mean, <laughs> I am in pain, you know, I am hurting and I just get up and I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, and, and, and Lynn's standing over, the, over there and he says, man, catch that horse and get back on him. I'm thinking, what the hell, you know, there's no way to so get back on that horse, you know, but that's the mindset that you have to have, I think, in life. And if more people did, they'd be more successful, you mm-hmm. know, because there's going to be little bumps that happen, right? There's going to be imperfections and, and, and setbacks and stuff, but you know, you got to be able to get back, get, get up and get back on and, and stay the course, you know, and have that path. And, you know, I love your, your mission to help people, you know, create wealth and, and get there. And it, it's super important, you know, and you look at like statistics of how much the average American has saved Versus how much debt? I mean, I forget it was, it was a crazy number, man. I mm-hmm. think it was like the average American family has like a hundred thousand in consumer debt, right? So you're talking like your vehicles, credit cards, everything else, and then like five grand saved. Mm-hmm. But in reality, you start looking down the road, and I can tell you that like time happens a lot faster than you think. So if you're not planning for your future today. And you're thinking like, hey, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to get there. Like when I make more money, I'm going to save, save more. That time happens, you know, and, and you've got to find a way no matter what it is today. If it's 50 bucks, you know, start small, start doing something consistently and watch how fast that compounds, how much better you feel, how much clearer you start thinking, you know, with that mindset of, mm-hmm. of creating wealth and getting ahead to put yourself in a better situation for you, for your family. Yeah. Uh, last question: What is one day you'd like to relive? Oh my gosh! One day <laughs> I'd like to relive. Boy, oh boy! I have to think that one through again. 
I don't want to get in trouble by not answering the right <laughs> question either, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, probably the, the right answer would be your wedding day or when your kids were born or something like that. But I'll maybe, tell you maybe what it's it the is. day, you know, surfing on the beach with your buddy. No, or I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly what it was. This is the day I'd like to relive. So we're at uh, Valley Center Rodeo before it became a PRCA rodeo, probably last year before it comes to PRCA rodeo. It's an open rodeo. And it's out there in California. I'm living out here now in Texas. I'm roping calves with a veteran calf roper. Kind of takes me under his wing, and we're just roping and tying all day. And when I tell you, I mean, we're out there at four thirty, five o'clock before the sun comes up in the summer. And as that sun goes down, and I'm post tying, you know, during the day, just going at it as hard as I possibly can, you know. So uh, I've I've got it down. You know, I'm I'm comfortable, I'm ready, I'm prepared. I've got some big old dairy calves of all sizes. I mean, I'm I'm flank and tying just about anything and everything that I could ever imagine. So uh Valley Center Rodeo is coming up. I enter, I drive out there, and I'm with Lynn, who's the guy that pretty much, you know, raised and mentored me in my cowboy life. And, you know, this is the first time seeing so we're laughing, we're pulling into the back end of the rodeo, and he's like, Man, I never thought I'd be getting in the rodeo with you, you mm-hmm. know. Um so we get in there, and I go back, and I look at the pen, and I mean, they're just just big old soggy, huge calves, you know. And and I'm watching the, uh, I'm watching the first couple guys run on them, and I mean, they're literally like it looked like a mutton busting, you know. <laughs> I mean, they're holding on, and they're just riding around the damn arena on these calves, and I'm going, man, these suckers are big <laughs> and salty, you know. But this guy that showed me, he did. He, he kind of had me prepared for everything, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, if they're like this, go, you know, do this, do that. So I just, I had a plan. I was more prepared than I ever was, you know, not like back in the days when I was day trading and just gambling. I mean, yeah. I knew I had a situation for, solution for every situation. So I draw probably one of the biggest calves up there, you know. And uh, my horse, I had two buddies of mine, you know, running running before me and using my horse, so he had already had two calves run on him. I back up, back in the box on this horse, and and I just never forget just nodding. And the whole deal happened so fast, you know. I just remember throwing. I barely remember throwing that rope. Like I didn't see anything, man. It was like one or two swings over, and just go boom. And next thing you know, I mean, I mean, he's at the end of it. I'm at the end of it. We're on the ground, and I look up, and I'm looking at Lynn at the shoot like this. Like and everybody's there with their mouth open, like oh my god! Like nobody roped a calf this right here, you know. And uh, I ended up breaking a barrier, <laughs> so it was for me uh, just one of the proudest moments of my life. Like throwing my hands up, freak! I did it, man! I'm here, you know. And he's right there, and everybody's like, oh my god! I can't believe it. So if I could ever redo a moment and relive a moment in my life, it'd be that one. I'd like to just. Like to just sit Take another, the barrier out. just another second before I drop my reins. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, so let's wrap up. Your uh, get a hold of you, John Keeley on Facebook. Uh, your I Instagram. I am John Keeley. Yeah, I, I am, am John, John Keeley, Keeley on Instagram. Um, business owners, if you have a business, you process payments. I almost guarantee we can help you save money and beat the customer service you're getting now um you can reach out to john you can reach out to me at the real crockett carruthers uh, or crockett carruthers on facebook our website is diversifiedpayments.com you can go check that out and we'll see y'all on the next one thanks for coming in john thank you